having me today. Okay, we'll start. So thank you again. Um, I'm really excited to be presenting this tutorial to you all on the Montreal Forced Aligner. Um, so let me just get set up here. Uh, so the first thing is if you haven't yet accessed the link that Juan has posted in the chat, please do so. I'm also just going to share my screen and display that. Um, so here, the link to the main handout we'll be using is at this link, eleanorshadroff.com slash MFA underscore tutorial dot HTML. And on that page, there is a link to download the materials that we'll get to towards the end of the first section and then the second half of the tutorial. So that page should look like this. And if you click on this, download the materials here a bit, then that here will should download a zip file. Has anyone encountered any issues with this download? Hopefully it's got some folders with some audio files and text grids and such in it. Okay, no, all right. All right, so I'm gonna start off with just um, an overview to forced alignment with a bit more attention to the Montreal forced aligner. Um, so, get this up and running. All right, so yes, this is the link, Hope, and it is in the chat. Okay, so first thing is just a bit of introductions. So you got a bit of an introduction to me. I am cognitive scientist linguist at the University of York, um, but I want to get to know you guys a little bit better so that I sort of know what, you, what your background is with forced alignment. So, uh, gosh, this is where it's like, I wish I should be good at Zoom at this point. Um, maybe what I'm going to do, because I can't immediately find the poll, is I'm going to go like this, stop the share. My first question to you all, and this is where you can just raise your hand, is how many of you have used a forced aligner before this tutorial? Okay, so a fair number, but not all. Okay, that's good to know. Um, how many of you have used any version of the Montreal Forced Aligner? So say version one. I know this is like fast hands up, hands down. Awesome. Okay, so a couple, but yeah, minority. All right. And how many of you have used the most recent release of the Montreal Forced Aligner? And I'll include like if you could get the uh, like a case study to run that's on the website okay all right this is good to know um all right so that's useful i'm going to share my screen again all right so yeah about me i am a cognitive scientist linguist phonetician and I have been very fortunate to work with many of the great minds behind the technology of forced alignment, um, with, especially with the Montreal Forced Aligner and one of the toolkits that's underneath the hood of the Montreal Forced Aligner, which is the Caldi ASR toolkit. That said, like I think many of you, I am mostly a consumer of this technology. Um, so I am not necessarily actively developing it. Um, so, and yes, I am more on the linguistic side. So when I describe, I'm going to describe the forced alignment system at a pretty high level. And I might be a little bit looser in my description here than say an engineer or someone actively developing these systems might be. So just bear with me with that, but it, I'm hoping to at least convey the gist to you as to how these uh, systems work. Some acknowledgements first. Um, Huge, huge thanks to Michael McAuliffe. He has been the primary developer and maintainer of the Montreal Force Aligner. He's developed it into something really powerful and I think really useful for the speech and phonetics community. He's also been maintaining the aligner for the community, actively engaging with the community. And he has personally answered the questions I've had in such a timely and informative manner. Um, if you were here just a couple of minutes ago, he actually pushed a new release for us just last night um, to fix up some little things that apparently Caldi had been updated really recently, I think, and a few things broke and he fixed it like immediately. So thank you so much to Michael McAuliffe. I also wanna thank the whole Montreal Force Aligner team. Of course, this tutorial would not be possible without them. 
Uh, the JHU called the team for their help back in around 2015. Um, I was, like I said, very fortunate to work with um, some of the people actively developing the uh, automatic speech recognition toolkit. So uh, people like Yenda Termal and Sanjeev Kudanpur, they, this is where it's just like, I happened to be in the right place at the right time that they were, and they were willing to train me um, on how to use Calby back then. And also to Emily Ahn, who I've been working with at the University of Washington, who has helped me work through uh, some of the newest features of Montreal of the MFA version two, and the audiences of previous tutorials of mine. All right. So the plan for today is to first have an overview to what forced alignment is, um, then focus on how forced alignment works with the Montreal forced aligner. We're then gonna do some installation and checks on installation um, and do try to just run the aligner on a very basic example. Then we're going to have a break, uh, five, 10 minutes, we'll play it by ear, see how everyone feels. And then try and work through some case studies to see the full function, not necessarily the full functionality of the Montreal Force Aligner, but some functionality of the Montreal Force Aligner. This is an incredibly powerful toolkit. I'm still learning it, to be honest. It was recently released, re released uh, as version two. And yeah, there's so much new stuff to it. So um, we'll try and get through some of it today. Okay. Also, if you have any questions at any point, um, just I guess type in the chat, though I don't know how good I am at monitoring the chat. So don't feel, uh, don't hesitate to actually interrupt me. Um, okay, so for the materials to download, uh, just open up the zip file for now. Um, if you want, you can put it on your desktop. That's kind of going to be where we'll, we'll put things for today. And yes, download links. Cool, awesome, perfect. Okay, so what is forced alignment? I'm hoping most of you, uh, at least in coming to this tutorial, sort of have a sense as to what forced alignment is. But if not, just as a reminder, it's a technique to take an orthographic transcription uh, of an audio file and generate a time-aligned version using a pronunciation dictionary to look up phones for words. This is at least from one version of the Montreal Forced Aligner website, really nicely stated. Also known as automatic segmentation, where, you know, we've got this a uh, screenshotted image of Prot with our spectrogram and waveform, and we have some transcript like the north wind and the sun, and we want to split that into phone level units. I'm going to use the term phone somewhat loosely here, not so much as a linguist, but more as an engineer, uh, where it's just some unit of speech that we as uh, the analysts consider a useful segment to analyze. So of course, there are so many benefits of automation. Um, so one big one is it saves time in the long run. Uh, there's consistency, we can minimize human error, replicability, it allows others to repeat the process identically. Um, you can easily correct mistakes because you can just go back and rerun the aligner. And um, the big one is you can easily process large amounts of data. And that sort of relates to the first point, which is it saves time in the long run. Um, so, of course, all of us uh, who have had to manually segment um, know that it is time consuming. That said, you still, any good science does not mean just uh, throwing automatic things at it. That's not great science. We still have to check our data. So, uh, but this will at least put some boundaries in place for you in reasonable locations so that you can just go through and fix it up pretty quickly, hopefully. Okay, yes. Did you know by one estimate using phonetic forced alignment reduces time spent on segmentation by about 75%. So it can be, it's pretty useful. Um, so the Montreal forced aligner is developed by Michael McAuliffe, Michaela Soko uh, I'm gonna butcher these names here. Michaela Sokoloff, Sarah Mihook, uh, Mikhail Wagner and Morgan Sonderegger at McGill University. It is currently, as far as I'm aware, um, it's currently and actively maintained by Michael McAuliffe. It does use this Caldi ASR toolkit. So it is um, using the same tools that are used in some of the state of the art automatic speech recognition systems. Uh, Caldi is sort of just, an, it's a set of lots of um, algorithms that are useful for performing automatic speech recognition. And the Montreal Force Aligner sort of picks and chooses from some of those algorithms to build a recipe that is pretty good at doing what we want it to do, which is uh, getting boundaries for speech segments. So it uses um, a triphone 
GMM HMM system. This is total, if this is totally out there for you. I'm going to go into what this all means in just a moment. It has a bit of speaker adaptation to it. Uh, one important thing to keep in mind uh, is that it does assume a minimum 30 millisecond phone. We'll see why that is in a bit. Uh, the English acoustic models, which I suspect are probably some of the most used ones, those are trained on Libra speech, uh, which is a corpus of read audiobooks, um, mostly American English, as far as I'm aware. And the um, primary dictionary for English is American English, though there is a British English one now. Um, the non-English acoustic models, ex uh, except for some French and German ones on the Montreal Force Aligner website, those are largely trained using the global phone corpus, but this is going to be updated very, very soon. Um, the global phone corpus is great, uh, but it has some uh, assumptions about what a phoneme is for a language that I think a lot of linguists may not necessarily agree with. So there's going to be a swap pretty soon as to um, what the non-English acoustic models are. And hopefully today we'll also see how you can generate your own acoustic models. All right, so overview as to like how we get from start to end with forced alignment. So typically we're going to have an audio file and a transcript to the audio file. We do need both pieces. So you can't just, this is not automatic speech recognition. Uh, technically um, the Montreal forced aligner now apparently can do some ASR, uh, but I'm not, I have not tried that out yet. Um, so you do need a transcript uh, that is just a sequence of words that appear in the um, audio. And what we do with these two pieces, the audio file and the transcript, is align. So what we want at the end is sort of the aligned version. Um, the first thing we're going to do, or the first thing that the aligner does, is it goes from the text to the speech. So it needs to obtain a sequence of phones. So over here, we have our sequence of words that is then sent through a pronunciation dictionary, which turns the sequence of words into a sequence of phones. OK, so the north wind and the sun and the pronunciation dictionary, as you can see, has all the words on the left hand side. It's got a separation and then it's got a canonical pronunciation over here on the right. And this phonetic alphabet. It's not IPA, though some of the, the, the Montreal Force Liner can handle IPA. This phonetic alphabet is actually um, one that's best suited to American English, though it is used for other languages. This is called ARPABET, um, A-R-P-A-B-E-T, okay, ARPABET. Um, and so this transcript is for every word, it looks up the word in the dictionary, it finds the canonical pronunciation, and it just creates a sequence of phones, okay? That's part one. So now we've got to see an understanding of the sequence of phones in the speech. Then from the speech parts, so we've also got our audio file. We can obtain a sequence of acoustic features, okay? So what the aligner will do is it will process the audio file moving from the start of the audio file to the end of the audio file, where I believe these are the parameters, though I could be wrong. Um, I'm pretty sure this was true, at least at one point, where there's a window of 25, uh, a window of length 25 milliseconds, and that shifted along every 10 milliseconds. And the acoustic features are extracted from the audio file, okay? The acoustic features that are used in the Montreal Force Aligner are something called MFCCs. These are sort of the most common acoustic features you'll come across in automatic speech recognition systems. And um, they say it's a MEL frequency capture coefficient. Uh, and there's a whole slew of them. It's just um, capturing spectral information about the audio at that point in time. Okay, so now we've got a sequence of MFCC. We have a sequence of phones in text, and we have a sequence of MFCCs that are just some numeric form. Okay, so we've so given a sequence of phones and a sequence of features. We want to find the best alignment. So where does one phone like an S start? And where does it end and transition into, say, an is sound in a word like six? Okay, so we've got a sequence of the phones here, and we've got a sequence of frames. This is where the what's called the GMM HMM framework comes in. So uh, 
though there's a little bit more to just that. So the HMM stands for hidden Markov model. So this is where it gets very loose and I might be a bit imprecise in my language. It's basically a chain of states with transition probabilities. Um, so we might represent a T as having a beginning, a middle and an end or final part. And you know, as phoneticians, we might think, oh, the beginning could be the closure period, the T, uh, the middle could be the release and the end could sort of be the, if there's aspiration present or something or the transition into the vowel. Um, and as we process a new frame of acoustic features, what we want to know is, do we stay in the same state or do we move on to the next state? Okay, so we've got two sequences and we're just trying to find the best alignment between them. But here we've got sort of the state guiding, do you stay in the same state? So that's this arrow, or do you move on to the next? The Gaussian mixture model part is, so remember Gaussian uh, distributions, yes, that's right, normal distributions of the acoustic features. Loosely, it basically knows the averages and standard deviations of each of the phone's acoustics. Um, so for each, uh, for each phone in the language, um, it has some representation of what the acoustics, what the expected acoustics are. Um, and it uses this information to help decide whether we stay in the same state or we move on to the next. Okay, so once you train the acoustic model, it has this knowledge. Believe it or not, um, training a set of phone models, so every language has, you have to define a set of phones, um, training a set of phone models is equivalent or it's like part of the same process as aligning a sequence of phones. Uh, the main difference is that training is like learning the model parameters and alignment is applying the model parameters where the model is that GMM, HMM framework with some extra stuff. Okay, so a little bit more on these acoustic models. Uh, we have this, this is that picture of our input, which is just a sequence of phones, the north wind and the sun, blah, 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 and the audio file that goes with that. Um, and if we have uh, a set of acoustic models or phone models um, that are trained on the acoustics, okay? When you use the pre-trained acoustic models from the Montreal Forest Aligner, just know that there are still some assumptions built in. So even though you are automating things, doing this automatically does never means that it's assumption free, right? These acoustic models are trained on some sort of data. And so uh, you have to beware your assumptions. So it might be that, you know, if you're using American English models to align British English or some other language, there could be some oddities that arise. Uh, so yeah, your system's not assumption free, but when is it ever really? You always come to the table with assumptions, always just something to keep in mind. So th um, the first part of the recipe for getting this set of acoustic models that figures out the alignment um, is what's called a monophone model. Uh, for those who are familiar with the with FAVE um, and many other alignment systems, they typically just use these monophone models, which is for every phone, predefined phone in the language, you basically just know what is the beginning of the acoustics look like, the beginning of the phone look like, what is the middle of the phone look like, and what does the end of the phone look like. And it's context independent, doesn't matter whether this T has occurred after an S or, uh, you know, before an E or before an A. Ah it just sort of knows the average acoustics for a T. Um, and it learns the transition probabilities and it uses that to do an alignment. And honestly, those systems are not bad for alignment. Uh, the cool thing about the Montreal Force Aligner is it actually does a bit more processing of the model. Um, and so it takes the monophone models and retrains them and learns triphone models and triphone models are context dependent phones they typically so each of these circles is an hmm state so a state in that hidden markov model the monophone model does actually uh, confusingly does typically have three states um, the triphone model does also have three to five hmm states but the thing that makes it a triphone is now we're taking into consideration what preceded the t and what followed the t um, so now we can model uh, get a better sense as to say things like co-articulation that might happen. Uh, and it's just a more refined representation of the language. Okay, so now it's learning the acoustic information for each of these states. 
Um, the Montreal Force Aligner goes even further and it also does lots of different transformations and adaptations uh, to try and understand and uh, speaker variability so it can be a little bit more flexible when it encounters a new speaker. Um, so I'm not going to go into details to how that works, but just know it does do a little bit of speaker adaptation, uh, which presumably should give rise to a better alignment. So, yeah. Um, so yes, this is just the triphone models. Again, if we have something like MFMFA, uh, it would be represented like this, where the hashtag is just the start of an utterance. We've got E following the start of the utterance before M. Then we have M following E and before another E. We have E following M before another F and so forth, okay? And these are now the acoustic models that are being used to align any new audio and transcript that is given to it. The output should look something like this, where we have north wind and the sun. The Montreal Force Aligner does give PROT text grid outputs, which is awesome for us phoneticians who regularly use PROT. Um, though, of course, you can easily convert PROT text grids into standard CSV files or something. Uh, so yes, we've got all our boundaries here. It does a reasonably good job. Um, there are some things that you can do to make it do a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, that is basically what a force alignment system is. It's composed of a pronunciation dictionary, a set of these acoustic models, right? We have one model for each phone. We actually get to define the phones unless you're using the pre-trained models. And then it's got these algorithms that um, do the alignment procedure. So figure out the best path, the best alignment through uh, between the audio and the transcript. Okay, so are there questions at this point? I know that was like a really high level overview um, to what force alignment is and potentially a bit fast. So were there parts that were unclear for people or things you might wanna follow up on? We're gonna see a little bit more of this in action as we actually start getting our hands dirty too. No, okay. In that case, um, let's go over to the on speaker learning. Uh, yeah, good question. Yeah. So yeah, could you briefly elaborate on speaker learning? Um, yeah, this is a really good question. So the when the pre-trained models presumably have some speaker adaptation, and basically it's just learning um some transformations of the models to better predict uh where the speaker is in the space so if um like the the one thing that it does do is it standardizes all the acoustic features so that you get sort of a uh you get standardized acoustic models so you know presumably centered on zero and with you know normalized uh and then it does additional learning to to figure out like what might be expected of a typical speaker. So if it does get like say a female speaker with potentially higher spectral component, more energy in the higher spectral uh, regions, then it will sort of shift the phone models up to varying degrees um, to accommodate for that. I'm, this is where I get like a little, uh, I, this is a little bit more out of my area, but some of the procedures are things like, um, FMLLR, which is uh, actually just maximum likelihood linear regression, um, but it's just so it's basically just learning linear regressions between the phone set phone models as far as I understand it, where it's like okay if the speaker if the speaker's S looks like this, then um, you know shift all of the phone models up in this way according to this linear regression between them all. That's my like basic understanding of it. Uh, could you tell us what the mean error compared to human annotation is? Um, actually, no, uh, I, I do know there are stats on this and it might actually, I think there was a UN and Lieber, UN, so it's like UN Lieberman and some other, maybe some other people, I think from University of Pennsylvania had a paper on this, maybe in 2018, where they listed some nice stats. Uh, it, there is probably a little bit more error than say trained annotators, um, or trained align, like, you know some like a phonetician oh perfect thank you tj is that the uh oh tj mar has a cool paper presumably on the performance of forced aligners so if you click on that link 
you can get some stats. So yeah, there are a lot of people working on comparing how each of these aligners do, do in various environments. And it does vary. Um, like I said, you're always bringing assumptions to the table about, so the models are, they all have different training recipes. They all use slightly different algorithms. Uh, and they also critically all have, typically have different training data. Um, and so whatever it's trained on is really going to affect its performance, like how well the training data matches the environment. And also, yeah, uh, what is the audio that you're using? Is it really noisy? Are you able to give it small units to analyze or is it just one really long audio file? Um, a quick tip, uh, tip is try and give it smaller units of speech to analyze if possible, like 30 seconds or less. Um, yeah, so there, there are tons of these um, performance comparison papers that you can look into. Uh, I actually, so as a consumer, um, I have tended to stick to the Montreal Forced Aligner because it is really reliable and it's really powerful. And a lot of these differences, at least between aligners, are not massive, in my opinion. Um, so that's why, and also, I don't know about anyone else, but I've had trouble uh, installing HTK recently. Um, HTK is used as a dependency for um, the pen force, or sorry, fave, um, and some of the other aligners. And HTK stopped being properly maintained as far as I can, as far as I can tell in 2016. And I think um, the computers have finally advanced far enough away from 2016. I'm just like, I can't get it to work for the life of me. That's why, that's why, sorry, there's no fave today because I literally can't get it installed. Um, all right, if using IPA or, oh, sorry, wait, I'm missing some things. Would you like, uh, would you talk about the training part during the workshop? I'm hoping we get to the training part during the workshop. Uh, the training is really straightforward and it's actually just one extra argument to the alignment procedure, which we are going to get some practice with. Uh, so it's, um, the only thing as I've been training, I, I've recently been doing a lot of model training on different languages. And uh, we'll see an example actually where we use a very small amount of speech. It doesn't work very well. Uh, so yeah, that's something to keep in mind. My guess right now is to probably need about like 45 minutes plus of speech to get something reasonable. But this is, this is just a guess. All I know is about like 10 minutes doesn't really cut it. Okay, or you're just gonna have to do a lot of manual cleanup, more manual cleanup than usual. Okay. Um, can one use monophone models in MFA? There should be a way to do that. I don't know exactly how, but I do know the Montreal Force Liner is powerful enough that you should be able to specify that. Um, so I, we would just have to go through the details of the documents to figure that out, but um, I'm pretty sure you can play around with the training recipe, but I will just be learning the sort of default training recipe. Are SAT models really the more accurate ones alignment wise? Presumably, so SAT is the speaker adaptive training. That's one of the speaker adaptation algorithms. That's, um, I think apply, it's definitely, in one of the versions I recently had installed, it was definitely being applied uh, while I was training. And that's one of the last steps in the training procedure where it has what's called speaker adaptive training. Um, I don't know if it's more accurate. That's where someone's going to have to like do the test. Some of the differences are so minor. And like, as scientists, we really always should be like checking up on what the aligner is doing anyways, that like, and you're probably going to like, you know, fuss with some of the boundaries that at some point, like, I don't know if some of these like improvements are totally worth it. Uh, that said, I'll take them if they are an improvement, um, but yeah. Uh, so they could be more accurate, but I don't know if it's like substantially more accurate. In theory, they should be. If using IPA or a consistent phonemic orthography is the pronunciation dictionary still needed? Yes, um, it is. This is, oh, sorry. I have such an excited yes, because uh, basically the acoustics are not actively used for determining the pronunciation. Only in this one case about modifying the lexicon, but I feel like this is like a whole new area of research that people could get into, which is sort of like trying to refine the pronunciation dictionary based on the acoustics, where like right now, the only way to interact with the pronunciation is to sort of predefine it. Um, you can predefine multiple possibilities, 
but you do have to predefine it. Um, you can't let the like acoustics generate possibilities for you. That's, I feel like a cool research could be done there though. Um, so yes, you always need a pronunciation dictionary, always, at least right now. Um, how sensitive is MFA to recording quality? It is sensitive. I don't know, it, it will, it, so it depends. Um, hmm. They're all going to be sensitive. So again, this all comes back to what was the model trained on and what is it being applied to? And it could be that like, if your training data was noisy or poor recording, a poor recording quality in the first place, that actually like, it's not, it might do better than one that's trained on clean speech. But again, that needs to be tested. Um, one thing that can throw the if it's like static noise, it's usually okay. Like if it's consistent, um, if there are things that are untranscribed in the audio, like coughs or bumps or clicks, um, those can sometimes, those are most likely going to affect the alignment. So you do have to watch out for that. Uh, sometimes it does get confused in thinking that speech when it's not. Okay, so in my work, so TJ, thank you. In my work, never seen SAT do worse than non SAT. Awesome. So yeah, um, and the Montreal Force Aligner, as far as I'm aware, again, at least in one of the versions I've been using in the past two weeks, definitely is applying SAT. So that's the speaker adaptive training. Can you get an estimate of uncertainty around the boundary placement? Well, it's sort of like you need gold data to do that. And even humans uh, are not exactly reliable. So I think what's typically done is you compare the inter annotator agreement among humans against what's going on with the aligner. Um, Sorry, yeah. can I just, can I just um, yeah, I was thinking also about whether the actually the model itself since it's based, you know, like on probabilities of changing state, whether in some cases it's more sure that that change of state should occur, and in other cases less sure. So not, it's you know, like uh, uncertainty, oh, not necessarily come in, yeah, like not oh, necessarily in relation has... to a gold standard, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> TJ, actually, have you worked on getting the confidence scores out of Caldi? Um, there I've are tried. you've tried yeah so there are caldi at least will provide confidence scores i don't know if you they can be extracted through the mfa um mfa yeah. comes oops sorry go ahead MFA comes with a bunch of caldi recipes and last time i looked this was back in june or july it did not have the goodness of pronunciation recipe built into it but yeah part of the if you know Caldi, you can get it. <laughs> yeah, so presumably it's something yeah. that we could, like, I'm poor Michael, I've like been emailing him nonstop about questions, um, but it's something I maybe can request. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That he, um, it's, it's because I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking of durations and, you know, uh, segment duration, and it would be nice to have, you know, to be able to extract it. I mean, you have to fix it anyway so it doesn't really matter yeah i mean like if you have enough data you can always like try and hope that the signal comes through the noise but yeah um with the other thing with duration data though it well you should always check it um the other thing with duration, yes. data, there is the minimum of 30 milliseconds uh so that's like so one thing. and it's on every phone is going to be in increments of 10 milliseconds so your resolution is in 10 milliseconds 10. Yeah. okay yeah because that's which the is yeah so yeah, if you remember Sorry, yeah. how it's extracting the yeah. acoustic information, it's got a 25 millisecond window shifted by 10 milliseconds. Right. So right. the resolution is 10 milliseconds. So that's yeah. definitely something that's... to keep in mind if you're doing anything with duration. That you, you yeah, I mean, I, 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 level I precision. Sorry, go ahead. I just no, no, sorry. <laughs> As you said, like I always check it anyway. But for example, mouse has a uh, resolution of 20 milliseconds, which is huge. Like. It, no, it's like, it's oh, bad, okay. <laughs> 20 milliseconds, yeah, because, you know, it's a lot uh, that you're missing. Uh, so knowing that it's 10 is better than yeah, 20. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yes, it, it that is nice. It's, it is 10, better than 20. Um, let's see. Uh, was Did I miss any? 
from above. Yeah, there's the nice paper from Gonzalez, Grandma and Travis. Training, yeah, I got that one. Does it give a deleted phone zero milliseconds or 10 milliseconds? I'm not sure, TJ. Uh, does it, I, I actually, what do you mean by a deleted phone? Does it automatically? I know that it drops one interval for each phone in the dictionary entry for the word. I see. So actually, I was not aware of that. Um, that so it will automatically assume. So between every phone, it will say, is the phone there or is it not there? I'm not well, entirely sure. I think okay. it must give 10 milliseconds because I've never. I don't think I've ever seen a deleted phone, so it must be the 10 mil, but I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. Do you, have you had experience with that? I actually was not aware that it considered the possibility of deleting, but that does make sense. This information about the 10 millisecond resolution was new to me. I know that it snapped onto some value. So I just wanted to know what you thought about how short it can go. Can it go to a zero millisecond interval or a 10 millisecond? I think, I don't know about deleted phones. My understanding, and it could be that Michael has done some things to make this like even more advanced, um, at least in previous versions, if the phone, my understanding was if the phone was in the pronunciation dictionary, it minimally got 30 milliseconds, though it could be what you're saying that if actually the acoustics didn't seem to match with the phone, it considered the possibility that the phone was deleted and skipped onto the next phone. But that would mean a, every phone had a minimum of 30 milliseconds, but I should now double check that. But have you had experience where you've come across aligned phones that are 10 milliseconds? I don't remember right now. Yeah, I don't remember right now either, unfortunately. But that's something we could, we should all keep an eye out for is, you know, if they're, so yeah, if it's not specified in the dictionary, we'll see an example hopefully today where um, we look at a case of schwa deletion, um, where it's specified of having the schwa or not having the schwa, and we let the aligner choose between the two. But that's where it's like pre specified in the pronunciation dictionary. And then it will just, of course, choose. If there's a schwa deletion, it'll choose the pronunciation that doesn't have the schwa in it. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, so let's go to the handout, um, which is the online one. Here we go, make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so yes, if you have not downloaded the materials, go. You can go ahead and do that. Exit out of this. All right. So most of the top part um, I've now already covered. Uh, so yes, the Montreal force aligner is, aligner is obviously a force alignment system, um, and very generally, the procedure is going to be where we need to prep our audio files that we want to align. We need to prep the transcripts. Uh, that correspond to the audio files, we need to obtain a pronunciation dictionary. So yes, the pronunciation dictionary is always required. And we need to obtain an acoustic model of the language's phone. So some representation of the acoustics for each phone that appears in our pronunciation dictionary. We're also going to need to identify or create an input folder that contains the wave files and these transcripts, which we're going to turn into text grids, and an output folder for the time-aligned text grids to be created. Um, the input and output folders do need to be separate folders. Uh, they can't be the same folder, or it'll just throw an error. Um, and we're, there's some other things we'll get to in a bit. The audio files. It used to be that um, you could sort of had to do a lot of pre-processing on the audio files if they weren't already in the format you wanted. These days, the Montreal Force Aligner is incredibly robust to audio files of differing formats, sampling rates, and channels. Um, so you shouldn't actually have to do much prep on your audio files. 
Um, but do note that whatever you feed the aligner, the aligner is actually going to, uh, by default, convert it to a wave file with a sampling rate of 16 kilohertz with a single mono channel. Okay, so it's just something to keep in mind that uh, unless you change some things that we're not going to get into, um, it's yeah, it's going to turn it into a wave file. So before I used to always recommend just doing this beforehand is just turning it into a wave file, uh, up or down sampling to 16 kilohertz and making sure you've got a mono channel recording but it will handle it for you. Uh, transcripts, the MFA can take as input either a prop text grid or a .lab or .text file. I've worked most extensively with the .text grid input, so I'm going to describe that. Um, we're gonna focus on those. Uh, the .lab and .text input is less flexible than the text grid one, so it only works when the transcript is pasted in as a single line. Uh, so you can't like specify start and end times for the that file type. So I just recommend using the text grid. It's a lot more flexible. Um, file names. This is really important. The file name of the WAV file and its corresponding transcript must fully match, except for that extension .wav or .text grid. Uh, and if you are doing, if you when you're training, and maybe we'll get to this, but this is just something to keep in mind. If you, if you do want the acoustic models to be aware of which speaker is which, um, in our experience, it helps to have the speaker ID as the prefix to the file name um, and something like an utterance ID as the suffix. Um, and this just is how Caldi works um, and how it creates files, but it, it looks for the speaker ID sort of in the first couple strings. Um, so this initial speaker prefix is at least true when training acoustic models. I'm not totally sure. I, I suspect it could also be required if you want the speaker adaptation to work during alignment. I'm not sure I haven't been able to test this out yet. Uh, but in any case, regardless, make sure to pay attention to point one, which is just make sure the names match. That's critical. Um, let's see, questions. Awesome. OK, on the issue of sensitivity to audio quality, also Ricker Dockman has worked on a paper using MFA and other tools for 1960s audio. That's awesome. Okay, the audio quality was not great. That's amazing. Okay, so, all right, so it is pretty robust to audio quality. Again, it's looking for transitions. So as long as it can still identify the highest probability transition, then it should work. Um, and yeah, the last alignment minimum phone duration was 30 milliseconds. I don't think I've noticed zero millisecond or 10 millisecond phones, but now I'm like wondering if I should go back and check. Uh, usually it's like, you know, I do the alignment and then I just focus on one consonant type or vowel type and yeah. Uh, so yes. And usually if, if it's a consonant, it's frequently there. Okay. At least the ones I'm looking at, which are word initial. <laughs> All right, um, so we've covered audio files, transcripts, file names. Uh, the next big thing, that pronunciation dictionary. Um, note that I will be using the terms lexicon. I might uh, use the terms lexicon and dictionary interchangeably. They mean the same thing. Um, the pronunciation lexicon must be a two column text file with a list of words on the right, uh, the left hand side and the phonetic pronunciation on the right hand side. And each word should be separated from its phonetic pronunciation by a tab, uh, though it might just need a consistent separator that's not a single space. But um, at least in the uh, downloadable pronunciation dictionaries, I think it's usually a tab. Um, each phone in the phonetic pronunciation should be separated by a space. So what this looks like is what I had in the slides. Let's get to this in a second. But here's that English dictionary, which we'll download in a second, where uh, we have tons of words in English with some canonical pronunciation. And in between the word and the phonetic pronunciation is a tab. Actually, is it two spaces? Might be wrong. It might be two spaces. It's just got to be consistent. Um, and each of these has a single space between it. Okay, so um, many to many mappings between words and pronunciations are totally permitted. It's always going to start from the word and uh, 
even and then just figure out what is the best matching uh, pronunciation. So you can have multiple pronunciations per word. Um, what's new to me uh, is you can even add pronunciation probabilities to the lexicon. I have not yet tried this, but it is an option. Uh, so this is where it's like the Montreal Force Liner has so much to it. It's amazing. Um, and an important, a very, very important point with the pronunciation dictionary, the phone set in your lexicon, that dictionary, that set of phones must match the set of phones in your acoustic models. Okay. And the orthography obviously must match the orthography in your transcripts. Okay. So you can imagine if a language has, you know, a um, two different writing systems, make sure the writing system is the same. It will, ob for obvious reasons, not work otherwise. Um, there are several options for obtaining a pronunciation lexicon. We'll go into some of these in the sections to come when we do some more hands-on things. You can download a large-scale pre-existing pronunciation dictionary. Uh, so like that English one I just showed you, that's part of the MFA release. I'll show you how to download it. You can also copy and paste some dictionaries from the Montreal Forced Aligner website. Um, the other big option is to generate a lexicon using a pre-trained grapheme to phoneme model. What is grapheme to phoneme conversion? That is taking the orthography and converting it into a set of phonemes or phones, okay? The Montreal Forced Aligner does have several pre-trained G2P models. Again, those are gonna be updated any day now to be slightly better, but they should work in the same way. You can also use another resource like um, these are Epitran or Zip, uh, which are rule-based systems that convert orthography to a sequence of phones. Um, so I do really like these systems. They're built by linguists and uh, they're really reliable. Um, so it works best, of course, on orthographies that are very transparent, where you know it's a straightforward mapping to the phonetic uh, to the pronunciation. Um, so those are just, that's actually like Zip is an online one. So, oh, I don't want that. Okay, Zip, Colin Priva. It was just, I think it's pretty new. Um, but if you go to his website, Zip Corpus, Corpus, you can convert to IPA and it has several languages here. Um, so what's one that I might feel comfortable? Okay, so we have Czech. And if I put in a check word, what's one that doesn't have diacritics? Um, I don't know, let's do mama. And then you can do translate, uh, let's do mamka. Translate. And it'll do the phonemic pronunciation. Let me do a different one. Oh, it's got the diacritics up here. Popska, which is cat, translate and it'll give you the IPA. So you can do this for a whole list of words and then just download the list of words. And hey, you might have to do a little bit of post-processing to um, concatenate the text with the phonemic representation, right? So it's in that two column format, but um, this is a great way to generate uh, your pronunciation dictionary. And Epitran is a similar system uh, that you can download on GitHub and it's built by uh, David Mortensen. Okay, um, just remember that whatever phone set you use for this pronunciation dictionary, again, it needs to be the same phone set as in your acoustic model. Unfortunately, MFA doesn't yet support uh, using pre-trained G2P models on Windows, uh, but hope maybe that will change soon. You can also train a G2P model using a pre-existing lexicon, and then it will generalize to unseen orthographic forms. So if you have a reasonably like a medium size to large size pronunciation dictionary, but you don't have every word in the language, um, you could potentially train a G2P model that then tries to predict. Um, if you feed it then a new orthographic form, it will try to predict what the uh, most likely uh, pronunciation is. And you can also create the pronunciation lexicon by hand, of course. And you can also, of course, go into some of these pre-existing pronunciation dictionaries and update them. That's all possible. Um, acoustic models, pre-trained acoustic models for several languages can be downloaded directly using the command line interface. We'll see this in a second. Um, and you can train an acoustic model yourself directly on the data you're working with. Um, so yes, I will see an example where we use about 10 minutes of speech and it's not great. Uh, 
I don't know what the minimum is though until it's like not bad. So like if you have 30 minutes, how does it change if you have an hour and so forth? Um, so yeah, we'll see an example. Uh, we, there is an example later on where we've got an hour acoustic models trained on about an hour of speech and it's it's not bad. Um, I haven't thoroughly vetted it yet, but it seemed that at first glance, it was like, it's okay. Um, as always, look at your data, check the output, just good practice. Um, worst comes to worst, you can just manually clean it up. Um, again, at least like it saves you that time consuming part of like inserting each of the boundaries. You can then just shift them. All right, um, so the next part of the tutorial is the practical where we are going to get our hands dirty. Um, and I'm going to try to present some tips and tricks along the way. Uh, but yeah, this version of the MFA is just, it's really simple to use uh, and it really makes good use of warnings and error messages. So uh, it's very robust. So there are fewer tips and tricks because it will just let you know when something doesn't work. Um, so at this point, I guess we should double check installation. Uh, like I said, a new release was just pushed last night. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to get it. Um, so yeah, I think Caldi, that underlying ASR toolkit, I think it had a substantial change. Um, it, yeah, I, for those who missed out at the beginning, it fully broke my aligner. Um, but you know, you can't fully understand something until you break it. Um, and then, you know, when you try and put it back together, it's never the same again. Uh, but many thanks to Michael McAuliffe for being so responsive and helpful trying to get that to and get getting that fixed. Um, the installation page is linked here. The new thing with installation is it's now released through Conda, which um, for some of you, I'm sure it's like, this is your bread and butter. You use this all the time. It is also very new for me. It's a package management system. Uh, you connect to a server and with a Conda installer, create command. It basically sends down sets of packages uh, that are, are needed to run the program properly. Um, my really like, again, this is not my bread and butter of like working with Conda, but my loose understanding is if you are an R user, it, it would be like the open source version or like a uh, it would be similar to CRAN. Uh, so how you basically do installed up packages and you get your package and some server sends down the package so you can use it. But the cool thing about this is it's like a set of packages and it creates an environment and it doesn't, those packages don't interact with other, if you have say NumPy or Caldi installed elsewhere on your system, my understanding is they don't interact with each other. So it's just like a separate little container. It's a little environment and they are called environments. Um, so something, so it's this conda create dash n aligner dash c conda dash forge Montreal forced aligner. Um, something just, I wanna point this out because this Michael actually pointed this out to me, which is this dash n flag, of course is referring to the name of the environment, the thing. And so you're, this is what you're going to call when you want to enter the environment. Um, so an important thing, if you're unsure if, let's say you have a working version of the aligner on your computer that's already called aligner you can just create you can just change the name of it here call it like aligner 2 uh and then it will just create a second version of the aligner and you can enter that second environment just to see like does it still work does the updated version still work for me and that way you you still have both versions and then you can later go back and uh, remove the old environment um, and let's see, so, um, and the other big thing, which hopefully you saw in installations is you, if you want to enter the environment, you have to do this conda activate aligner. All right. So you have to make sure the aligner is activated. You do need to reactivate the aligner every time you open a new shell or command line window, um, at least on a Mac, uh, you should be able to see which environment you have open in the parentheses before each shell prompt. So. Mine starts off with base, and then I do conda activate aligner, and then I'm in the aligner environment. Okay. Um, so, questions. Okay, you can see that base aligner thing as well on Windows. That's good. Okay, yes, I'm excited to break it. Hopefully it doesn't break like mine did. That was um, some last minute pressure. It was like last night and it was just, um, yeah, 
a 50 exchange, 50 email exchange with Michael where he was wonderful. Um, but you learn so much in that process. Like you really don't understand something until you fully break it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, all right, so um, let's test, let's start testing this. Um, so we're just going to do some installation checks and then we'll take a break um, and get back into some examples. Um, I think we'll do the alignment after we take a break. So let's see, let me share my screen. Okay, so if you don't, actually another question for the participant, for everyone. Who has never touched the command line or terminal? And don't be shy. I just want to make sure, like, it's okay. I'm going to try and be clear. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So if you're not familiar, there is this thing called the terminal. It's called the, it's a command line window. A sh you might call it a shell or, um, yeah, the term, Mac calls it terminal. So you want to open up that on Windows, what does Windows call it? Command prompt DOS. Can some some Windows user help me out here? That's <laughs> bigger. Command prompt. Okay, or CMD. So I think in Windows you should be able to find it from the search bar. On Mac, if you go to your launch pad, you should be able to just type in terminal and it will, and you can click on that then. So no, don't open up Miniconda. So Miniconda was just needed to install the environment. And as long as you have the environment installed, uh, then we just can access it through the terminal. So just your command prompt or, yeah. Okay, so as you can see right now, I'm, um, so, so, so quick overview to this command prompt, uh, command line thing. Uh, this is a way of basically communicating with your computer directly uh, without the user interface that is nicely presented to us on say a Windows machine or a Mac machine um, where, you know, I've got my finder or in Windows, you have your search uh, button with all the, with the menus and you, of course, all the windows that make Windows windows. Um, so I can move around my computer using the graphics user interface here by saying, I wanna to go to the core of my computer. I wanna to go to my desktop. I wanna to go to the documents folder and I can move around by clicking on these folders. Uh, the terminal will let you also move around the computer, but you just have to type to move around the computer. And so, um, yeah, basically when you open up the command line, it starts at the root of your computer on Mac that, and so this is my user's Eleanor Shadroff folder on Mac, and it is also represented in shorthand as this tilde. Um, so if I do PWD on Mac, this stands for print working directory, it tells me that I am in my home directory, basically, user slash Eleanor Shadroff. Again, the shorthand form is this tilde, which is really useful for Mac users, and I highly recommend making use of that tilde. Saves you a lot of keystrokes. Um, on Windows, uh, I believe you just type, let's see, I actually have this written down. Is it just CD and it gives you the directory? It's at the end here. Um, if you just type capital C, capital D with no argument following it, uh, then it should tell you. It is changed directory, but the internet, at least the internet tells me that if you don't put an argument after it, it will list your current working directory. So only if you put something after the CD, will it change directory. Does that work? Oh yeah, okay, good. Okay, the internet was right, thank goodness. <laughs> I have not actually tested this out. Um, so I am currently in users slash Eleanor Shadra from the graphics user interface. You can see that in the Eleanor Shadra folder, um, I can navigate like one of these subfolders. So again, think of like, think back to syntax in your tree hierarchies, we've got a directory structure. So underneath this user slash Eleanor Shadroff root of the tree, there's uh, several folders um, like desktop documents, downloads and so forth. So I can actually from this, I can move down the tree to my desktop folder and do something like CD space desktop. 
And hey, now I'm on my desktop, which you can see right here. On um, Windows, it's the same thing, except it's capital C, capital D. Okay. And if you want to see what's in your, uh, what's on, what's in this folder, oh, lowercase works fine too. Awesome. Uh, then you can do ls, and it should list. This is for list. It should list the contents. I've got some old things there, so sorry. Uh, of the desktop. Um, and let's see. On Windows, ls is dir. Is that correct? Dir. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so this is just from this, you, we can move around the uh, computer using the command line, and we can also tell the computer to do things using the command line. So uh, I might, so again, using the graphics user interface, I might say, hey, I want to open up prot, and I'll like click on the prot button and it opens up prot. You can also actually tell the computer to do that without clicking on things. You can just directly speak to the computer. And this language that I'm speaking in, uh, uh, in Mac is called bash and it's based off of Unix. Um, again, I don't think it, it's not exactly Unix, but it's based off of Unix called bash. On Windows, you're speaking to your computer in DOS, DOS. So if you've heard of those, that's basically how you're communicating with your computer. Um, you could also technically communicate with your computer in different languages. You just like prot or like R, you just have to tell the computer which language you're speaking in, so to say. Um, all right, so let me close this out. Uh, uh, what else do I want to do? Okay, so now we just want to, to access the aligner. If you already have it installed, you should be able to just do conda bigger activate aligner okay and what you can see here is that um it changes from base to aligner okay so does that who is that not currently working for okay one person that's the one person okay 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 so what's what's going on with yours caitlin Feel free to speak. So does yours throw an error message of some sort? So I don't think sound is coming through. So one thing that I, um, Mm -hmm. Maybe in the chat, can you put it in? Is everyone else's working? So presumably if you, um, yeah, if you were able to get through the installation instructions, you should be able to enter, okay, cool. Uh, you should be able to enter the environment. Um, now we are in this environment that, you know, the Montreal Force Aligner team has created for us. And it has a ton of packages um, in it, uh, like Caldi and like some version of NumPy that works best with their, uh, with their um, system and a bunch of other packages. I think a lot of them are Python and so forth. And they just make the Montreal Force Aligner work. And they also have included their functions and algorithms and stuff that we can access. And all of these now are, Basically, there's a suite of Montreal Forced Aligner commands that um, all start with the uh, pre with start with the command MFA, and that's sort of saying, "Hey, I want to access the Montreal Forced Aligner command X." Okay, so we just type MFA first. First, the first thing we're just going to do is just check our version number because it's simple. So just type MFA space version. Okay. And let's see if this works. It might take a second. And it should say something like 2.0.0 or higher. Does anyone not say that? And just out of curiosity, who says just 2.0.0? <laughs> no, Kayla. 
Caitlin, let me know what you're what uh what happened then. And back. I can try. <laughs> yeah, okay, you're back now. All right. <laughs> Apparently, I moved to the place I can speak in and I can't get Wi-Fi. Um, <laughs> I don't know when you lost me. So if I'm in, I don't know if anyone else in Windows is having this issue. Um, if I'm in the Windows command prompt, I mm -hmm. even Condor activate aligner doesn't work. Um, whereas what if I'm in message? what's called the Anaconda prompt, oh. it does work. Interesting. Um, it's like it hasn't reached like the hasn't set itself up probably like it's only set itself up locally or something like that um, and so okay for, same for uh, something else so uh florent is having the same issue yeah, as well is it um are you also on a windows computer yeah you do need to change like this is where i was spending so much time changing my bat like the profile the, some like hidden files in the system and updating them again and unfortunately i'm not like very I, I don't think i'm um in the position to advise on how to change those paths the conda prompt is a command prompt that knows where all the condos i suspect are. well you could still try to run it inside mini conda yeah i suspect it needs okay, to be this is what always needs to happen with fave as well you need to put it in the path okay that might just be a windows otherwise you need to update the path yeah um this is where it gets a bit complicated especially yeah, between the different yeah. systems but I would say if it's working in mini condo or anaconda, maybe just if it's not broke, don't <laughs> yeah, don't fix it. So um, we'll just keep working with that. I think it's probably the path. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So 2.0.0 B9 was the one that he released last night, um, and that should hopefully work. Um, so the next thing, instead of loading CMD directly, look for anaconda prompt. And it should load an instance of CMD that should work. I see. So it's like, is that how the environment works on Windows, maybe? So to enter the environment, you actually just have to go to Anaconda. Okay. I'm also learning so much with this new release. So I'm kind of like, I'm hoping I'm a couple of steps ahead of you guys, or at least many of you. Um, but this release is very new and fresh with a lot of really great things. Just get a Mac, guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Max are nice, you know. <laughs> All right. Um, so active, we activated the aligner, we checked the version. Um, sneak peek. Okay, so this is right before we take a break. Um, we're just gonna take a look at all the commands that are available to us through the Montreal Forced Aligner. So to do that, we can type MFA space dash H. Okay, and H stands for help here. Um, if we hit enter. Hopefully, yes, it prints out a ton of things. Um, so it has basically all of the secondary commands that you can add to MFA. So you can call the align command or the train command, like if you want to train acoustic models, uh, validate um, model, which is useful for uh, downloading and inspecting models and so forth, we'll, we'll go through some examples. Um, and you can see what each of these arguments do. Uh, so yeah, align is align a corpus with a pre-trained acoustic model. This is going to be a big one for us. Um, so we are going to cover, hopefully, uh, which ones I did list it at some point. Okay, we're going to cover align, MFA align, MFA model, which actually has like a third argument to it, which is MFA model inspect, MFA model download, MFA model save. Um, and hopefully with time, MFA train. I actually might skip the validate one, though that one is useful. I'm just, um, I rely on error messages. Okay, so, uh, which is not great of me. All right, if you ever need a reminder about how a specific command works, you can add dash H after it for a very detailed overview um, of how the command works. So if I want to see how MFA align works, there are two ways of actually doing it. One is the more detailed, one is the less detailed version. So I type MFA space align dash H. And so I want help on the align command. And it gives me a very detailed overview as to what are the arguments that the align command takes and what are the optional arguments or flags that you can set. So this is another um, concept to uh, running things or not only running things in the command line, but more general working with commands. Um, but I just want to reiterate what it is, which is uh, 
we have the command, which is sort of calling things and then um, required there are arguments to commands just like in syntax how you know a verb might have two art two uh, noun phrase arguments or whatever dp arguments so it has two arguments a command might also have a certain set of arguments those are you must specify those in the command if it doesn't if you don't specify the argument the command won't work then there are a bunch of optional arguments which i might also refer to as flags and optional arguments um are specified with these dashes and you just do a dash s and you can list some extra things that sort of tweak the default um, command okay um we will see some examples of this but the mfa align arguments the required ones are um you have to list where's the corpus directory where's the dictionary path where's the acoustic model um and where's the output directory okay so it's sort of like input and output are sort of uh flanking the at the edges, but then we also have to give the pronunciation dictionary and the acoustic model and we'll see how to do this. Um, the other way to see what a command um, how a command works, I think this is more of a shorthand version you just do MFA space align hit enter. Does it give you yeah and it just gives you then the required arguments Okay, so that's the abbreviated version of getting help. Um, let's see miss some questions. Oh yes, Windows has been making strides toward a native version of Bash. I have heard, I have heard of that. I haven't heard about any updates recently. Um, oh yes, uh, yeah. If anyone wants to like create the PC um, version of this tutorial, that would be kind of amazing because I don't have access to a PC right now. Uh, I think the documentation is pretty clear. Okay, I'm getting OS OS error. Cannot load library. Oh, okay, Christina, this might be the error. It could be the error that I had um, last night. Could be. So you have, it, just as a sanity check, do you have Miniconda 3 installed? Christina. Yeah, I, I just installed it all. Um, okay. And it was, and it, so I, I went through and I even, checked by like doing that pip uninstall and then it was gonna it found it so it was like oh or do you want to uninstall i said no so it's it's obviously yeah. there somewhere but it's not so you're doing the second set of um upgrading from non-conda version no i well i just used that command to see if if it would find some weirdness and i see so, you know because i couldn't do the find the version even when i did the version um tried to check the version it gave me this ose error cannot load library um, okay um but it might be me so i'll just keep on hacking away at this i was just wondering if anybody else had that um so what i would recommend doing is actually just uh if you can actually can you type um does conda if you just type conda enter does that work for you or do conda info dash dash ends e yeah ends. that that worked that works and you can see the environment there and it has yeah. the name aligner yep but when you do can you and you can activate it so you can do conda yes. activate aligner okay that works and um in that case you might just maybe which version do you have uh so mfa underscore ver or sorry mfa space version when I did that, that's the thing that that um, I got the OSE error for. So I can't use mm -hmm. any command with from uh, MFA. MFA. So in that case, I would recommend actually just reinstalling it. Um, it might be that you just happen to get that one version that's like not working. Okay. Um, so one way to un uh, to remove it that I was doing last night, um, someone else who's maybe more well versed might have a good response to this. So if you do conda and let me just see if I can paste this in. This was the page that worked best for me. Um, I did this conda and remove dash p, and then that path that's listed in the conda in, uh, environments. Okay. So this one here. So just remove it and then try to rerun um, the 
in the installation, this conda create dash n aligner, just grab okay. a new version. Okay. And let me know how that goes. All right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did someone else have an error? So Caitlin, this one, huh? Okay. Caitlin, I might recommend a similar thing of just removing the environment and reinstalling, which uh, were you able to get MFA space version to work? They all work. They just then have that error underneath them, which I'm assuming at some point is going to cause me an issue, but it has just hasn't yeah. Been so I'll so, get all the normal response and then I'll get this error underneath. It's really strange. Okay, so that's what was happening to me yesterday too, where it was like it worked up to a point and then it just crashed. Um, maybe try doing the same thing where you remove the environment and grab another one or just create, if you, if you don't want to deal with the removing right now, create another environment, um, that has a slightly different name from a liner, but I would probably recommend just removing the old one since it's not working. Uh, so this pip uninstall is really if you this pip uninstall is only if you had I think it was version 1.1 so there was like a couple months there were a couple months where it was still you still had to do this conda activate aligner but it wasn't the conda forge version so if you had that if you ever had to do conda activate aligner that's the only case where you should do this pip uninstall uh otherwise if you had montreal uh the montreal force aligner version one um, then you can just do the uh, basic installation, I believe. So if you had like, a, if you have a very old version, like I would say, well, old is in like January, maybe like from February or January this year or before, then you can follow the all platforms instructions. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll we'll take a break right at this point. Um, now that we know the aligner is uh, presumably working, though, I also hit some of my errors once I tried out the align command. So we'll see more there. Um, should we take like five minutes or five, 10 minutes? What does everyone think? Any recommendations? I don't care. Yeah, okay. And if you have installation questions, we can um, maybe this is also a good time for us to work through those. So as we say in the UK, we can take a comfort break right now. So let's meet back at um, uh, at the half hour. Um, so seventeen o'clock here. Is it noon? Wait, what time is it? Is it noon already? Eleven no, twenty-five. Sorry, I can't do. <laughs> numbers in me or this is why I have the computer work with the numbers <laughs> yeah right <laughs> I have a quick question. Yeah. Hey, Eleanor. Hey, good to see you. Yeah, or well, here you're all. Oh, no, no, <laughs> <myself>. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm working with multiple monitors, so hello. Oh, nice to see you. Um, uh, okay, so uh, the, my, my, my question is that I'm on this Anaconda, uh, Miniconda page here. Um, uh, basically installing conda and i just noticed this note i'm wondering if this is part of the problem it okay. says like something with mac os catalina and later this is the default shell is zsh you will instead need to run something you know and then it has this sort so i'm i'll show you where i yeah do you want to screen can you screen share yeah i think here let me So, because I just got a new computer, so I'm uh, that's why yeah. I'm not sure. It's this here. Do you think this 
If the if if the the, the computer is new, you might have the latest version uh, of the operating system and also the the latest uh, chip. Right. And I think if you uh, sorry, I think you should be able to just install the default one uh, okay. with on the latest computer. Um, but if that didn't work. Okay, well, I'll just try reinstalling. I was just wondering if that was yeah. something that it's, I should... So oh. Catalina's after Big Sur, is that the next I, update? No, that's before. Um, oh, I don't know why I didn't hit that issue then. And I have, I have Monterey now, so... Is that the but, latest um, one? Yeah. You never know. It's, it's, <laughs> I mean, Big Sur is the... so. I, I've been getting updates of like update to the newest one. I'm like not before the tutorial. <laughs> the tutorial. Yeah. I mean, the latest is Mon Monterey, um, which came out like a few weeks ago. Um, and if the laptop has been, you know, bought recently, yes. it will it's like have a week that. Old. It, it, it's a then week yes, old. I mean, you can you can easily check if you click on the Apple in the top left yeah. corner. There's about this Mac, and it should say either Monterey or Big Sur. Yeah, I've got Monterey, and it's yeah. So I, I had issues as well when I installed Miniconda. Okay. Then things weren't working and I tried installing Anaconda, the full thing. It's like okay. two gigabytes of this is, but, okay. but, <laughs> um, but but then it worked. Okay. Uh, I don't know why. I was I, I don't really use Python really. I'm 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 a na person. Uh, yeah. and I asked a friend of mine who's you know like a, a real Pythonista and he was like he has exactly the same laptop. And it was working with him using Miniconda. And he was like, I don't know what you're doing. And I was, I'm following the instructions, but it doesn't okay. work. Is so that perhaps you thing? can try. I, I don't think it's, I don't know. <laughs> because so I'm, I'm actually to, using like, Homebrew. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I literally I was like opening up my Bash profile and manually changing things. And, oh. I, um, do you I know uh, Home? homebrew yeah so yeah so i have everything set up with homebrew and i use um uh, zesh rather than bash um mm -hmm. so i i i it might be that the mini conda thing does weird things if you have other things installed with brew but, but I, don't know. I see what is this what is the other version you're using not bash zesh? Uh, is, is, yes zesh or Z -Z -S -H, or sosh, I never SH, quite like know. Like yeah. what, yeah, Which what is the, the shell default is called? One. It is the yeah. default one. Why, okay, In, so. Yeah. What is the, actually, what is the difference? So am I actually using Z, Zesh as the ZSH as uh, well? You can, it's a okay, can, I, can you share the screen? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's all right. <laughs> no, so this is where it's like, I'm a consumer and I like get things to work and it's like, right. yeah, that, I'm not that, a computer definitely... scientist, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's definitely bash it says uh if you yeah. look at the right, on the, the title top. it that's says bash. Yeah. okay so it wasn't incorrect yeah <laughs> right. no 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 it's it, it has become the default in the new operating system like in the new versions of mac os um mm -hmm. but uh but i think if you had but it's weird i think if you had a version that had bash as the default and you upgrade yeah it might not actually take you to zesh it, it might keep bash but i'm not sure I'm I'm one of those people that like being on edge. So like as soon as there's something new, I just update things and oh, you're then great. I spend time. I'm always yeah. like, we'll give it like a couple of months, see what breaks, let them figure it out, and then update. It. Yeah. You're wise. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Sometimes <laughs> I was not wise last night when I'm like, I'm going to update <laughs> and not save a copy of this environment because I don't know. I didn't know at the time how environment really worked um now i do so that's the great thing well i kind of do um give me one second i'll be right back on another note if anybody is here is anybody when i'm at eleanor's um uh tutorial and I click the 
um, link to Montreal Forced Aligner, I get a page does that does not exist. Is there? It's oh, like it could be an old link. I had um, copied some parts of the old uh, aligner, so that's okay. probably just me typing an old path. Okay. Uh, or sorry, copying parts of the old tutorial. Uh, and I probably kept the old path. Which one is it? I'll fix it. And it's so very I'll merged Montreal forced aligner. Oh yeah, it works. Oh, it does. Yes. Now, no. Sorry. Now my system works. I'm sorry. Not not the link. Oh, okay. I was like, oh, <laughs> they're no, multitasking, yeah. of course. Um. Yeah. I All think right. I just copied that original section out because okay. what I'll do is I'm going to update my. I'm planning to integrate this with the rest of the Corpus Phonetics tutorial soon, so that this will be okay. more easily accessible. Um, so I will update that. Thank you. You're oh, yes. So the link. Um, yeah, if you just joined, we're just taking a quick break right now. Um, the link is here. Tutorial. Yeah, so Stefana, thank you. And I did it. I uh, installed Anaconda and then just reinstalled everything. And I don't know what of those tricks worked, but <laughs> I don't know if it was the uninstallation or the installation. <laughs> it's the, you know, it's the, it's the high. It's yeah, the, it's one of those, you know, it should be. You know, it's the equivalent just, just hitting the, the screen same, on the side they, of <laughs> they like, never you know, do. The, like it should be exactly always... they should work the same everywhere but they never it never does there's always something that you don't know it's there it's yeah. gremlins yeah. <laughs> gremlins proof of the existence of <laughs> yeah i had one of the like just restart the terminal fixes the other day where it was like it's not working it's not working it's just like exit restart oh it works now <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, if you just joined, um, please download the zip file. So there's a line right at the top of the tutorial that says, um, what does it say? Materials here, download the materials here. So just click on that here uh, so that um, it downloads the, tutorial, the zip file and that has all the audio and text grids in it. Ooh, yeah, root directories with spaces in it are frustrating. Um, I mean, you can presumably, the, uh, where did, are you interacting with the root directory? Like, can you specify that? Uh, like maybe you could use the escape. I, think I might be able to, I might just go one level higher. Yeah, my computer was set up by the company that provided it and it's been causing me a nightmare ever since. It's a great computer yeah. with a really annoying folder name. I mean, were you at the Newcastle <laughs> tutorial in 2019? I, just I remember wasn't, that. I was at UKLBC. Oh, okay. So <laughs> there there were a bunch of us there were so many people with like university owned computers and it was just nightmarish because every time it's they just, asked like, it should, There should be a rule against it. Never it was put like, spaces. The root was like miles away from where they actually <laughs> wanted to be and I was just like oh no <laughs> in when I uh, moved to Edinburgh I explicitly asked for you know full admin access to to my plan it was yes of course and I was thank you because I'm instead in Germany that. health and safety I like everything had to go through the um through the the IT guy and 80% of, you know, my requests were rejected because no, there are security concerns installing that particular software. So we're not going to install it. And I was, but I need it for research. No, but it's not safe. <laughs> so I'm happy now that I can just do what's antivirus there. also every so often tries to eat MFA, which is fun. Uh, it just quarantines it. <laughs> wow. This is, yeah, the, the good thing. I don't have admin, full admin access. So like, the other my other solution was like oh i'll just create another user profile and like on the computer and try to install the mfa there which also has advantages where it's like a completely blank part of the computer but um i can't create new users on my computer but the good thing is that uh with max at least at our university they don't like monitor like they yeah they just let you run away <laughs> it was like yes. <laughs> All right, I guess we'll, let's, uh, I don't know, kind of enjoying the break. <laughs> Pick back up soon.
Has anyone been able to get Fave um, or HTK to work recently? No, I, I was wondering like, has someone found the magic solution? It might be dead unless, yeah. Though I was uh, on Twitter, they were saying how Fave Extract now will take MFA input. So if you remember, uh, if you've worked with the aligners before, um, let's see, the Montreal Force Aligner puts the words on tier one and the phones on tier two, and Fave does the opposite, I think, or did the opposite. So yeah, Fave Extract will still work with Montreal Force Aligner. Mouse has this weird output of tears named in German and oh, that's kind of fun it was, yeah no it was it was a bit of a is there anybody from the IPS no I don't think so. <laughs> but this is being recorded so <laughs> yes 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 can you delete that part <laughs> I know right we'll just cut this all out yeah and I don't know if there's anybody who has been using emu among you all, um, but unfortunately, it's not going to be developed anymore. Oh, that's yes. a shame. Yeah, so um, now we have like all of these databases in EMUR that <laughs> will have. Are they to, exportable, you know, or are they yeah. really dependent on? Okay, that's good. They, I mean, the the, the main thing is that uh, EMU allows you to do hierarchical annotations. Um, and and that gets you know flattened out when you expose it yeah. to text grids, but yeah. That's a shame. Well, just in case people are away, I guess we'll give we'll start back up in a minute. On another note, it's really nice to see yeah. you, Eleanor. It is really, it's so nice to see everyone here, especially it's like, I, I feel like I haven't seen the community in so long with COVID and everything. And I haven't, I don't, I'm trying to remember like the last conference I went to that was uh, like speech focused or phonetics focused. It may have been ASA last year. And even then like, yeah, that was an interesting setup where it was like all, uh, what do they call it? When you can't see the other participants, what do they call that? The, uh, the web Seminar, webinar style webinar. webinar. Yeah. yeah. I kind of wish I could have like, it's kind of nice seeing the other people in the room with you. Ooh. Oof. That might be above me. How to use a different directory to your root. So I tried just navigating to a different directory and running it there, and it still tries to go into my root directory because this space <laughs> is killing me. It's going to kill my PhD in one space. Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. I've aligned uh, all my data. I'm learning this to teach other people. <laughs> um, no, no. I will watch and learn and work it out, and we'll see. We will see. I mean, one option is like if you're com like if you can't easily get it installed on your computer, is if your university has a cluster like a server you could access. And the downside is it's all hand like it's all through the command line. Um, but if you sort of know what you're doing, you could do it that way. Or yeah. This is where I think because you're on Windows, I'm even more hesitant to advise. Um, it may be something about like on Mac, I had to access my what's called a it's like bash underscore profile and update. You could potentially update the um, path that it's using. So I suspect that the path that it's tried to use is broken and it might just be a matter of like going into that bash profile but for you it's not going to be a bash profile it's going to be 
some Windows specific profile. It's in the, of... it, like weird enough, it's uh, there is no file for it. It's from the control panel, um, but I do not remember where. And last time I used Windows, it was Windows Vista. So uh, perhaps it's in a different place now, but it's it's like from, from the graphical interface of the settings, you can actually add things to the path. <clears throat> okay, well, I hope you're able to get that resolved. Um, and hopefully we'll see how everyone else is now handles um, actually aligning something. So we're going to now resume the tutorial. Uh, we've had a nice long break. It was great catching up with everyone. Um, with some people here. And uh, so let me just go ahead and share my screen again. Okay, so where are we in this tutorial? We are down. Okay, so as you can see, hopefully as you can see, I've got the practical section of the tutorial here. We've gone through checking the installation, activating the aligner, checking the version, and looking at some of the options um, for this MFA suite of commands. So um, we're now going to start running the aligner. Um, and I'm going to, to try to keep everyone together in the herd um, just for today um, in the hopes of minimizing path errors. I'm going to ask that you please put the MFA tutorial 2021 folder on your desktop unless you absolutely know what you're doing with paths. Okay, so if you're like new to the command line, I would really recommend putting the tutorial folder on your desktop. The nice thing with the desktop is I believe it has the same name on Mac and on Windows. So, um, so you can see on mine, I've got my MFA tutorial 2021 folder on my desktop and click this. Within that, there are several examples with some WAV files and text grids or other things. Um, we're going to put, so as I said earlier, we have to create some input and output folders for the aligner uh, to read from. We're also going to put all of those on the desktop, okay? So um, I know this differs by generation, but uh, yeah, your compu the computer does have like a very strict directory structure um, that we need to always be really aware of when working with the, the command line, that there is this like hierarchical tree-like structure to your folders, and it's really important to remember how the folders are structured. Um, to keep things simple, we are going to put things on the desktop. Uh, and I'm hoping that the desktop will be close to your root folder. Um, so on mine, the desktop is, as we saw earlier, is users slash Eleanor Shadroff slash desktop. Um, for Windows users, it might be, might be something like C colon slash slash your username slash desktop. Is that right? Okay, or something close to it. We'll, we'll check out the path um, with that print working directory or CD function in a bit or command. Um, the Montreal Force Aligner has actually been, it should have been placed in your documents folder. So this is where you can go to the graphical user interface or the GUI. Um, so if you hear the word GUI, that's graphical user interface. Um, if I go to, so I um, so the documents folder is in my root folder. So user slash Eleanor Shadroff. If you go to the documents folder again, documents is another one of those nice folders that has the same name in Mac and in Windows. Uh, so the MFA should be there. I might have more folders in here than you do, and it's okay if you don't have. Does is it actually empty? If you've never run anything, does it start as empty, or is there any file in it? Does anyone not see the MFA folder? I just have command history, command underscore history dot YAML. Okay, but there is a document slash MFA folder. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So that's where the Montreal Force Aligner is going to do all of its processing and it's going to create lots of folders. Um, so it's just useful to know where that is because sometimes you do need to like interact with it a little bit. Um, so that's in your document slash MFA folder. We're going to put our workspace on the desktop. So one other thing, whenever you're aligning files, especially if you're using uh, data that does, basically um, for good data hygiene practices, make sure you always have an accessible copy of all of your data that you are not processing, okay? Uh, that is just the raw data, back that up, 
um, and try to process on a copy of that or just make sure you can like reaccess an older version. Because if something goes wrong, luckily the Montreal Force Aligner these days is so much more robust to issues and is unlikely to delete your data, but at one point it would delete your data. Um, so just in general, uh, it's always good to like have, make sure you're using backups and you always have access to a previous version of things because we are going to be running things and processing things. And uh, yeah, I would just hate for that to get your raw data to get deleted and then it's, it could be hard or impossible to recover. Um, what else? I am going to, so when you're in the command line, uh, so right now, again, I'm getting this, so right next to, right before my prompt, I've got this tilde indicating that I am currently located in the root, in this user slash Eleanor Shadrach folder. Um, I'm actually going to try to run the commands from the desktop folder, which is a little less efficient, but should hopefully demonstrate what these paths are. So a path is just an address uh, to a file or directory on your computer um, where the uh, address is basically all the folders um, above it. So if I wanted to go to the desktop, I could say CD, um, I'll write this out in long form. Uh, this is inefficient. I don't have to do this, but I'm just gonna show you CD slash users slash Eleanor Shadra slash desktop. And that is the address of my desktop. So if I want to go there, I have to type the address. Okay. And so I can hit enter. So now I'm on my desktop. Uh, and if I wanted to go to my documents folder, I could do CD space slash users slash Eleanor Shadroff slash uh, documents. Okay. And I hit enter. And now you can see right here, I am in my documents folder. Okay. And if I did uh, LS to list, this is um, D-I-R, dir, in, uh, right? No, no, it's Ella, shoot. How do you list in Windows? Is it dir? Yeah, okay. So that just lists the contents. Okay, so I'm just navigating between directories here and, and I'm navigating by typing the exact address. You can also navigate by moving up or down by using the relative location. And this is what I'm going to try to avoid to some degree, but it's so like ingrained in me that like, uh, yeah, it's just useful. So some one relative thing you can do is move up one folder. So again, if you think of the directory structure of your computer, we have the users folder underneath that is the Eleanor Shadra folder and underneath that is the documents and the uh, desktop folder. Let's say I want to go back, I can go back up the tree to the Eleanor Shadroff folder by doing CD space dot dot, okay, period, period, and hit enter. And now you can see I am back in this tilde folder. So if I do print working directory, I'm back in the user slash Eleanor Shadroff. And another relative path that I can do is because I know the desktop folder is one folder below the Eleanor Shadraw folder, I can just do the relative path and say CD desktop, okay? Because it's just a one folder jump there, okay? And um, I can go back up doing CD space dot dot. And let's say I wanted to go immediately to the Montreal Forced Aligner tutorial folder. I can again use a relative path by doing CD space Again, the MFA tutorial 2021 folder is nested within the desktop, right? It's desktop and then underneath within the desktop is the MFA tutorial folder. So I have to type CD space desktop slash MFA tutorial 2021. However, so, and if I hit enter, it takes me to the MFA tutorial 2021. I can do LS or Windows DIR. And it lists all the contents of that folder at the highest level. Okay, so this is just um, some interaction with the command line. And I can go back up to the root, the Eleanor Shadroff folder by doing cd space dot dot slash dot dot. And that takes me two folders up. Okay, so now I'm back in that home directory.
Um, so those that's just a quick overview to paths. I will try to run things from the desktop folder just to keep things consistent. Um, one other thing I want to point out with at least the Mac terminal, and I think most command lines will do this. Uh, you can hit tab to auto complete. Okay. Um, so if so, if I want to go to the desktop, I can do CD space. Let's say I want to go to the MFA tutorial folder. I can do CD space de. Okay, so I've typed the D. I can't. If I hit tab, it's going to make a noise at me. This is because there are multiple folders or files that start with capital D, like documents, downloads, desktop, Dropbox. Those all start with D. Um, so I have to keep going a little bit, but I can type desk. And I think at this point, it should be the only folder. And now I can hit the tab key and it will auto fill it. So this is really useful because one thing I want to emphasize is that um, spelling and capitalization and spacing and slashes all really, really matter, okay? Um, now it shouldn't be a situation where you're going to, hopefully, I don't think um, I've introduced anything where you're going to hurt your computer in any way. Um, but uh, basically a lot of errors, uh, just when doing stuff on the computer tends to come, they tend to come from typos. So do just make sure you are capitalizing things appropriately and spelling things appropriately. And if you find yourself running into an error, that's probably one of the first things you should check is like, did I spell everything correctly or do I have a typo? Okay, so CD desktop, and I can also do the autocomplete if I wanna to go to the MFA folder, MFA tab, and it fills it in for me and now I can just hit enter. Okay, so th those are some nice shortcuts. Any questions on your really fast paced intro to the terminal? No. Okay. Just check the chat. Yep. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go to just up one directory to the desktop. Okay. So again, just think of the tree. I'm now on the desktop. Um, now we're going to run the liner. So if you open up uh, the example one from the Montreal forced aligner, um, we have got, so I'm going to go to my desktop, open up the MFA tutorial 21, 2021 folder. Example one has some text grids and wave files in it. This is American English speech uh, from the all-star, the Northwestern all-star corpus. Uh, I'm, for the sake of time, you're just gonna have to trust me that like, well, let me see if it'll play. Sometimes um, uh, Zoom doesn't let me play audio properly, uh, but this is just the hearing and noise task sentences. A boy fell from the window. Let's see if it'll play. A boy fell from the window. Okay. It's like big dogs can be dangerous. And let me just fix my spectrogram. So this is, uh, as you can see, it's already been sampled. Um, so you can see it's cut off because the sampling frequency, I believe, is already 16 kilohertz. Um, big dogs can be dangerous. Okay, so we've got um, a text grid with the utterances in it. And we have the start and end times marked for each utterance. Uh, it doesn't really, right now I do have a little interval between each of the um, utterances. These days, if you're familiar with the old Montreal Forced Aligner, you couldn't reuse the boundary uh, to act as both the start of one utterance and the end of another utterance. In the newest release, I'm pretty sure it's not sensitive to that anymore. So you can technically reuse a boundary in your text grid to serve as both the end of one utterance and the start of another. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind. It's a slight difference if you're familiar with the old aligner. Um, but yeah, so what I have here are wave files and text grids that are fully prepped for the Montreal Forest Aligner. Okay, we have the wave files. There's nothing funny about them. They're 16 kilohertz. The text grids are um, all ready to go. The utterances are marked up. Uh, there's start and end times. Each of the utterance intervals is very short. Um, so the shorter you can um, make the interval that has to align, the better. Uh, we'll see. It, you can get away with doing really long utterances, but you're more likely to have the aligner derail in those cases. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, let's see if we can get this to run. 
Um, so there are two things. We have the wave files and we have the text grids. They are all prepped for you, okay? The um, next thing we need is the lexicon or the pronunciation dictionary and the acoustic models. Since this is a straightforward American English, this is a super high resource language. Uh, there are tons of, um, we already, we can basically download a really thorough English pronounce, pronunciation dictionary and we can download the uh, acoustic models for it that have been, it's been trained on a ton of data. Um, so we can download these pre-trained models directly from the Montreal Forest Aligner. Uh, of course, you have to be connected to the internet, which we all are, but um, what we can do is you can run this from any folder as long as you are in the aligner environment, okay? Uh, so this gives us the aligner environment, gives us access to those MFA commands. And what we're, we're, we need to download the acoustic model for English and the dictionary for English. And this is very straightforward. Uh, we're gonna start with the acoustic model and it is MFA, space, model, space, download, space, acoustic, because that's the type we want, space, and English. And this is where you just kind of have to know which language you want, um, but it is just called English. And if you hit enter, hopefully it works. Okay, so it thought for a second and, um, and is now returned to the prompt. Any issues? or errors that people have encountered with typing that. Nope, okay. The next one is um, we need the dictionary, which is also just called English for American English because I got there first basically. Okay, so it was MFA space model space download space. Okay, so that's all the same. Now we're not downloading an acoustic model, we're downloading a dictionary. So we're going to type dictionary space English and hit enter. Okay, so it thought again and now it's back to the prompt. Um, now what just happened? Uh, it, did some, it did do something. If you go to, so now let's just go to your, the documents folder and see if I go to the MFA, there should now be, if you didn't have it before, there should now be a folder called pre-trained underscore models. And in that there should be two additional folders called acoustic and dictionary. And so now it's stored. So I have more acoustic models in here um, because I've done some other things. I've cleared out most of it, but you should now have english.zip. Don't open that up, um, just leave it zipped. Uh, and now you should also have english.dict. Okay, and dot, um, you can actually, this is just a regular text file. So the way that I just open this is with um, text edit. It, it might, like if you just double click on it, your computer might say, I don't know how to open this because it looks like a weird extension, but just tell it to open it with some standard text editor. And this is just, I believe it's an expansion. It either is the CMU pronouncing dictionary, if you've heard of that, or it's an expansion to it. Uh, but it, as we've talked about before, it's all in ARPABET, which is the phone set that is um, that was kind of designed for American English. Uh, but it is sort of stress marked. It's got uh, primary, secondary, and zero stress marked in it. Yeah, it is a very large dictionary. Okay, so we have acoustic models. We have our pronoun uh, pronunciation dictionary. We have our wave files and we have our text grids with the utterances put into them with the right alignments. So we're basically ready to go. Oh, one other thing, um, before we check out the alignment, um, which here is just ridiculously fast, let's, um, there's some other things you can do when you download the models. You can also inspect them. Uh, so let's just try this out. So I'm back in the terminal and the inspect function is really useful to see like what is the assumed phone set of this acoustic model uh what other specifications does it have so if we can do this um using again it's the same prefixed commands where it's mfa it's always going to start with mfa space model because we're interacting with the model space inspect space acoustic space english and now we can it'll give us some um information about the English acoustic models that we've just downloaded. Okay. Mm, so 
it's this is who you would cite to use it. Um, the frame shift is 10 milliseconds. So yay, that's correct. It is using MFCC features. And this is the phone set. So um, yeah, pretty straightforward. It does not actually, this is really interesting. I did not know this. Um, it does not perform speaker adaptation. So someone had asked about this earlier. Uh, and it does not perform linear discriminant analysis on features, which is another transformation. Okay, so that's actually useful to know. It still works really well. Um, oh, sorry, yeah. So yeah, MFA, space model, space download, space type of model you want, acoustic dictionary, et cetera, and then the name. Okay. Any other questions or uh, does anyone need me to back up a little bit? Okay. So um, just for completeness, let's also inspect the pronunciation dictionary. Uh, you never know what, what else you might find out about it. Okay, so it's MFA space model space inspect space dictionary space English. And once you've got that in, press enter. Press enter. Oh no, and I got an error. Darn, what did I do wrong? Did I spell something wrong or is this a version issue? Did someone else get this error? Got the same error. Hmm. Well, this could be something in the release. Um, let me see if it works. Do I have another dictionary in there? I do. I'm just going to see if it works on the other one to see if this is specific to the English one or Guarani or any lexicon text. Oh. Uh, oh, you know what? I might need to give the whole. Let me see if I if I give the whole path, will it work? No. Okay, so I think this might just be. This could just be a, a still another bug in the system. We're gonna skip it for now. Um, I'll talk to Michael. Well, I'm sure we'll solve it within like two hours. So uh, the, it should be possible and it should be up and running soon. At least the acoustic model one is working. Um, okay. So um, now for let's. So now we want to run the aligner again. We have all the ingredients. We just need to do a, some additional setup. So we have the wave files, the text squares, the pronunciation dictionary, and the acoustic models. Now we need to create an input and an output folder. Okay, so on my desktop, I'm going to create a new folder and you could call this something a little bit more uh, informative. I'm just for the time being, I'm just gonna call it input. And I'm also gonna create another folder called output. Just keep it simple. And we're gonna leave the output folder empty. Uh, that's where the Montreal Forest Aligner is going to send the output files, hopefully. Um, yeah, everyone's getting the same error. Okay, so we'll we'll notify Michael, and again, he'll probably fix it in seconds. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, the output folder should be kept empty. The Montreal Force Aligner will deal with that folder. Uh, what we need to do now is open up the MFA Tutorial 2021 folder, go to that example one English, and select all of the WAV files and text grids. So just ignore that .text file that just has some additional information. I'm going to select all of those. And I'm going to, on Mac, I'm going to Command C on Windows. I think it's just Control C just to copy them. And I'm going to paste them into this input folder, which on Mac is, you can do Command V, uh, Windows Control V, V as in Victor. Okay, so now I've just created a copy of those files. Um, so this way, again, I'm not potentially messing up the raw data, even though I actually, these files are publicly accessible. So you could always go and retrieve them again. Um, okay, so we've created the input and output folders. Now we are at the alignment step. Um, so we're going to run the Montreal Force Aligner. So I'm just gonna get rid of this folder. So go back to your command line. And we are going to run the align command. Uh, so this is MFA space align. And 
I always forget the order of the arguments. Actually, I think I might remember them this time around, but I frequently have to remind myself what the order of the arguments is. So before I put any of the arguments in after a line, I'm just gonna hit enter so it can tell me what arguments I need to put in. So once you get past all of these bracket things, uh, the four arguments are, where's the corpus directory? Where's the dictionary path? Where's the acoustic model path? Where's the output directory path? Okay, so I am currently on my desktop, okay? That is where I am located in the computer. Um, I am going to write complete paths uh, to each of these files. Well, no, I'm gonna write a relative path for the corpus directory. So just, uh, do I wanna do that? I'm gonna write a complete path. <laughs> we'll keep it simple. Okay, so we're gonna do MFA space align. This is the first alignment thing we're doing. So I'm not going to set a cleanup flag, but for every other align, actually, no, I am. This is good to get into the habit. Um, whenever I reuse the input folder, you have to clean it up before you reuse it. Um, we'll go into this a little bit more, but just specify dash dash clean. Okay, that's the optional argument. So let's say we'd run this aligner and we wanted to rerun it using that same desktop slash input folder. Uh, you have to like, clean it out, otherwise it doesn't overwrite things. So I just always write dash dash clean, just good habit. Um, okay, now we need our arguments. Where's the corpus directory? The corpus directory is, I'm ch I changed my mind, I'm gonna do relative paths because uh, otherwise it won't work as well with, for the Windows, uh, Windows users. Um, the corpus directory is just in that input folder. So I'm gonna type IN and I can hit tab and it found my input folder because it does exist in the desktop. Okay, that's where the corpus is. The dictionary, this one's a little annoying. Okay, actually I do need to give the full path for this. Where's the dictionary? Someone gonna respond. Where is the dictionary located? In the documents folder, exactly. So the dictionary is has this long path in the documents folder, the MFA folder, the pre-trained models folder, the dictionary folder, English.dict. Okay, a little annoying to write out, but you get used to it. Or you can just move the dictionary somewhere else, but we'll keep it where it is. I am using tilde as shorthand for user slash Eleanor Shadrov. If you're on a Windows computer, I don't know if there's a shorthand, but you should be writing something like C colon slash slash. Okay, We're, we'll see if this works, but I'm going to write tilde slash documents slash MFA slash what well, came after MFA. MFA is pre-trained models is the next one. Pre-trained pre underscore models. I'm gonna auto-complete with tab. Uh, and then I need dictionary. Ooh. dictionary tab. I like autocomplete because it's also a sanity check that I am getting the right folder. And then it's english.dict. Okay, so I'll give you a second to put that in. And I'm also just going to hit space. So between every argument should be a space. The acoustic model path is a little idiosyncratic. All you need to write, you don't need to write the path here. You just write English. As long as english.zip is in that folder, you should be able to just write English, no zip, just English. Okay, and the last argument is our output folder. We're already on the desktop, so I'm just going to write output. Okay, or I can just double check that with the autocomplete. Okay. All good, okay. And fingers crossed this runs. I'm gonna hit enter. Okay, this is good. So now it is aligning. Okay. So it's generating those MFCC features. This is these normalization, kepstrel, mean, and variance normalization. It's doing an alignment. Oh yeah, that's really useful. Thank you, Catherine. Um, 
I'll show that in a second. You can drag the folder to the terminal window and it'll write the address for you, the path. Okay, and it's done. And it took on me, my computer at least uh, 40, 40 seconds. Okay, any, so um, we can check. So now the output should be in the output folder on my desktop. So I'm just gonna open up that folder and sure enough, there are four text grids here. Any issues? Does it work if I only use English? I don't, so in my experience that hasn't worked, but I don't actually know if I've fully tested this out on the, hmm. I haven't fully tested um, that out on the new version. I mean, we can try it right now. Uh, let me just create a second. I'm just going, you don't have to do this with me. I'm just gonna try this out, output too. So it would be MFA align dash oops. clean input. Uh, so we want to try it. Let me do english.dict english output to. Does that work? No, it can't find english.dict. And let me just try doing English. Does that work? Oh, oh, maybe it does work. It does. Okay, so that's really useful to know. Um, okay, so so how did I, what did I just do? Okay, sorry, this is also really useful. Um, if you ever wanna like abort the command or anything in the command line, if it's like, you know, not, like if it's just kind of freaking out or not engaging with you, um, you can do, you can uh, hit control C. So you hold down the control key and you hit C and it aborts and it'll take you back to the prompt. This is super useful. Uh, so I just aborted the alignment. Okay, okay, so yes, this, um, so it turns out we can also do the same thing. Thank you, whoever pointed that out or asked about that, Keith, that we can do the same thing. Before I don't think it worked, but now it seems it does. So we can just, um, if it's in the pre-trained models folder, we don't need to specify the whole path. Okay. Um, any issues with alignment? Did anyone's alignment not run? So let's just check out what it did produce. So I'm just gonna open. Okay, so the text grid actually has the exact same name as the input text grid. So just keep that in mind that they are different. Um, so just as a reminder, this was the input text grid. And so it's got the utterance level alignments, the output one, looks like this. Okay, so we have words on the top tier and phones on the bottom tier. Okay, and it doesn't look too bad. A boy. Okay, so, and you can check that out. You can see the quality, um, but pretty straightforward, yes. Um, so I'm assuming based on the fact that no one is speaking up that it worked for everyone. Oh, you got an error. Okay, so um, what do you want to share your screen? It's okay if you don't want to. Um, you can also just describe the error. Okay. Can you uh, provide my screen? Share it. Oh, let me see. Because errors are great, Lord. Like, at some point, someone is going to encounter this error <laughs> too. So, I should, do I need to stop the share first? I think so. Yeah, I'm gonna paste the uh, error description in the chat just so you have it there. Okay. So yeah. All right. Okay. So there were no. There was an error in the run. There were no files found for this corpus. Please validate the corpus. So. Presumably what has happened is it cannot find any files in the input folder. Uh, so if you go to your the input folder on your desktop. Yeah, this is it. Can you, okay, so in your terminal, can you type a PWD? Okay, and can you CD into that input folder? CD space input enter and LS 
just ls and hit enter. Okay, so this is the one thing I was concerned about. You might have some permissions set on your desktop that you can't actually write or read from the desktop. So for in this case, I, I don't exactly know how to override these permissions. Um, but uh, basically, you should maybe you want to use a different folder. So maybe instead of desktop, if you put it on in the documents folder, mm -hmm. Okay. So put so whenever we're on the desktop, I guess just use the documents folder. Actually, go on. Let's just double check the documents folder too. Can on your terminal. Let's make sure you have right access to the documents folder. So do cd space dot dot. So the period period slash dot dot. Let's see what level that takes us to. Press enter. We might need to go one more. Okay, so we're at the root. And so now CD into the documents folder. Okay, and do LS and let's see if it lets you do that. Oh, just allow, okay. Okay, so presumably it should work. So do you wanna try putting the input folder, dragging the input folder into documents Document. and also the output okay. folder, the output folder will also be affected. Only input and output, right? Yeah. Okay. I think um, basically, I, I think it has something to do with the permissions that the Montreal Force Aligner doesn't have permission to uh, read or write from the desktop. And I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know how to fix that. Okay. Oh, it could, yeah, try that. And now um, if you, oh, the other useful thing, if you hit the up arrow on the in the terminal, it will go back to previous commands. This is another useful thing. Mm -hmm. And so if you go to the align, um, oh, so you're already in the documents folder. So will this work? Yeah, this should work. Um, do I have to edit anything in the, in the command? Actually, I don't think you do because you're currently in the documents folder. So it should work see if this works. Yeah, the time it takes to run can vary between computers. Uh, hopefully. We have clean set. Well, let's give that a second. Um, sometimes it does just take some time. Oh, okay, that's good. Okay, so we'll let me know if you get that. Well, let's, I guess it'll come up in a second. Any other errors? Maybe pseudo, yeah. Okay, that's progress. All right, so it should be fingers crossed that's working now. Um, so it's just something about uh, yeah the administrator access to your desktop folder or the uh, privileges. Okay, um, yeah, no problem. So yeah, whenever we're on desktop, just translate to documents. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that is an error. Like if you are teaching this to students, that does happen um, that someone is using a folder that doesn't have read write access. Okay, um, next step, let me share my screen again. Not able to find the dictionary. Uh, so, um, I'm not totally sure. What you could look for is in the search function um, on Windows is look for were you able to download the models, Grant? So, okay, so, so, so just for the recording, is there any place other than documents? So it can't find the dictionary. Is there any other place uh, than documents I could try? So on Windows, what you could try is looking for pre-trained underscore models and looking to see where that folder is on your computer. Does that and then at least on Mac, you can like click on it and you can show an enclosing folder and it will show you where it is in the computer. So is it able in the search, see if it can retrieve pre-trained pre underscore models. 
that should be pretty unique to the Montreal Force Aligner. Okay, I'll give that a second. Um, I will, oh, sorry, I did, was not sharing my screen while doing that. Um, yeah, so on Mac, you can just search pre-trained acoustic models, do show an enclosing folder, and it will pull up the folder that it's located in. Okay. Um, so, okay, yeah, give that a try. Hopefully it can find it. Um, I'm going to move on to the next step. And actually we might have some choice at this point uh, because we are moving into the higher level examples. So let me pull up the uh, examples. So I have two examples where the text grids are not prepped for you. So in my experience, the longest, one of the longer parts of doing forced alignment is actually preparing the text grids in a way that's like useful for the aligner. Now that I'm starting to train acoustic models, training can take a really long time, but typically there's some amount of like figuring out how to get the text into the text grid in some rapid way uh, that takes more time. Um, so yeah, usually you just have like a transcript, but you need to put that into a text grid. I have two prot scripts here that do it automatically if you put your files uh, in the right, if you have the right information. Um, so the first one is a really dumb, but uh, straightforward way of doing it. It's probably the riskiest way of creating an interval in a text grid, um, but it does work. So I'll show you this. This is creating a text grid for the Montreal Force Aligner Simple. Um, so basically all it does is it takes the entire transcript, it puts it into an interval in a text grid, that corresponds to the wave file you have, and it just outputs the text grid for you. And then you can, it's a really long utterance though. And as I've been saying, the longer the utterance, the more likely the aligner is to derail. And this, I use this term derail, uh, derailment, because it's like the aligner is like a train on a track because it's like working with sequences of things. And if it gets off track, it's kind of, it can be a disaster. Uh, the Montreal Force Aligner is a bit better than some of the older aligners in terms of like recovering itself, um, like finding the track at some point. But some of the older aligners, like the Pen Force Aligner, it's like once it got messed up, it was just a complete mess of an alignment afterwards. So yeah, in general, try to make your utterances short uh, and like put more boundaries in the text grid if you can. But sometimes for whatever reason, we can't necessarily do that or we'll take the risk and hope that it all works out. Okay, so if you click on this prot script, um, it should just be text on the screen. Um, hopefully you have prot installed. Uh, what I want you to do is open up a new prot. So open up prot and then open up a new prot script. This is the easiest way that I've found to do it. I'm sure there's a way of just like downloading this as a file, but this is how I do it. Open up a prot script. So we have an untitled script. And I'm just going to copy and paste this whole thing. So you can do a control A or highlight it all or command A. Um, on Mac, again, I'm gonna, going to command C to copy this, or you can right click and copy and command V or Windows control V into the script. And I'm just going to save this. And I'll call this create underscore text grids simple dot prot. Okay, you can call it whatever you want. Okay, so at the top of this script, um, there's a change me section. Uh, and what the, so what the script does is it takes as input a directory containing wave files and it outputs text grids with a single tier called ut for utterance. Um, and it just has one interval or like, you know, the text is just contained in one long interval. Uh, and the first boundary is currently set at 20 milliseconds from the start. And the second and final boundary is currently set at 50 milliseconds from the start. You can play with this, but um, this is just how it works. The change me section, is the only part you should, you should definitely change. The maybe change me is if you wanna change those boundaries. Okay, so. It's a little bit bigger. Oops. Everything else hopefully will still work, even though it was written in 2018. So now we need to update our path again. 
to okay so first of all we need to put our full our files in a location uh to process them so let's create i'm going to because i are i'm just going to delete the input and output folders select those move move to bin or move to trash one of uh one of the americans i work with uh always finds it a novelty when she views the move to bin on the UK computers. <laughs> um, okay, and we're just going to create um, another input and output folder that are empty again. Okay, just keeping things streamlined. And now we're going to go to example in the Montreal Force Aligner tutorial folder, go to example two. And there are just, oh, I did include the prop script, that's right. There are four wave files here um, and there's a text file, but let's copy, we're gonna copy the wave files into the input folder. Okay, and this is where it gets really risky and not great, okay? So these um, wave files, I believe are, they're the same ones that we just aligned. Um, but instead of marking the utterance boundaries, I just pasted the whole transcript in. Okay, so it's risky, but I'm going to copy. So in ht1 underscore English dot text, there's the whole transcript. Okay, and we can just copy that. And in the change me box, it says text equals text dollar sign equals and within the quotation marks okay so don't delete the quotation marks we're going to paste that whole transcript in okay this is not necessarily the greatest way to do things and the other thing we just need to update is the path to our desktop this is from an older computer so once you have the transcript pasted in update your the path to the desktop. So for me, it's user slash Eleanor Shadroff slash desktop slash input, because that's where the wave files are. So remember, it's going to read in each of those wave files and create a text grid for each of them automatically. Juan, well, just to make sure, are we going until six, uh, till we have another half an hour? Is that right? Okay, once you have that set up, try and give it a run by clicking on run, run. Okay. Oh no, did it, oh yeah, there it goes. And now if you check your input folder, there should be a text grid for each wave file. Anyone, did it not work for anyone? So we can just, I'm going to open up one of the, these pairs. So you can see this is a really ugly interval, okay? Of just everything this person has said in the order they've said it. I hopefully, I, I believe they've all, they all say it in the same order. Actually, I didn't fully check that. But these are just some toy examples. Just open this one up. A boy yeah. who fell from the window. All right, so once you have that all set up, then we can rerun the aligner, right? Because now we have wave files. We have now prepped our text grids. They are in an, in an appropriate format for the Montreal Forest Aligner. We've already got a downloaded English dictionary and we've already, we already have an, a downloaded English acoustic model. Okay, so I'm go now going to start typing the align command. Again, everything starts with MFA space align space and now we need our four arguments which are um, the path to the input folder oh sorry always clean out this time we really do need to set this clean flag so i'm going to do dash dash clean and that the reason i'm doing this let me show you really quickly in our documents folder mfa you can now see that from our last alignment, there's a new a new folder that's been generated called input underscore pre-trained aligner. 
this in the prefix input here refers to the folder that we call that was our actual input folder right the one on the desktop that we put our corpus in and it puts all of the files and the whole model inside or like yeah all of the files for that processing inside of this input pre-trained aligner folder okay so if you want to like i recommend just poking around in that at some point just to see sort of what the internal parts of it look like but we need to because we're reusing the name input but for a different task we need to clean this model out first otherwise it's not going to overwrite what it did before and it's just yeah not fun to deal with so this is why i always use dash dash clean just in case there was something there before just clean it out okay so that's the flag dash dash clean space now we put our four arguments um and see stefano uh Shafana, sorry okay so um dash dash clean four arguments first does anyone remember what the first one is remember the two things that come at the edges yeah so it's going to be the two things at the edges of our arguments are the input folder and the output folder and the model sort of internal so we have input <clears throat> i'm already on the desktop so the input folder is on the de desktop then we have our dictionary which we now know we don't need to write the whole path as long as it is in that pre-trained models folder just write english and the acoustic model also has the name english and then we are going to write our output to that desktop output folder. And you can just go ahead and hit enter. Okay, and hopefully it aligns for you. Did anyone run into any errors? This is the exact same, almost the exact same process as before, but not with a text grid that's not as refined as the one we had before. These CTMs are, um, they're like, I think they're like conversation time marks. Those are basically uh, where the boundaries are. So that's all it's generating. Okay, and it took about the same amount of time. So now if I open up the output folder, um, I can read this, do I have the sound file? Okay, so now we've got some weirdness happening. Okay, so this is the risk you run into by giving the aligner a really, really long interval. Okay, so you can see the alignment is not nearly as good as when we had the smaller utterances. So this is something to be aware of that the longer you make that alignment window, the more likely it is going to mess up. Okay. All right. So it sort of got, it's not horrible, but it did get a little messed up from uh, that click at the beginning. Okay. Everything else looks reasonable. I always just scan to see are the spaces where the spaces should be. Um, so let's see. Somebody stole money so it's okay all right i think um but yeah that beginning part that's kind of what happens if you don't have a yeah if you don't delimit it a little bit better okay um so prepping the text grids is typically going to be not done for like you're going to have to do that yourself in the vast majority of cases um i have included there's another script here where if you have timestamps um a, like a text file with timestamps that will insert the boundaries for you, but this might just take some additional scripting and prot or R to get things to um, to sort of automate this process, but it it is kind of important to get smaller intervals uh, to align. Otherwise, yeah, there's just more to clean up after the fact. Um, so I'm going to skip over example three, uh, but do like feel free to try it out. Um, actually, the script you would use for the text file I've provided is actually the second one, just if you are trying it out. Um, so example four is modifying the lexicon, which um, is a really fun way to use the aligner. Uh, so we have two examples. Um, I'm actually going to do example one, which is nonsense words with illegal consonant clusters in English. 
And so like our research, my research question might be, did the participant produce a schwa in the consonant cluster or did they not? Um, so the issue with this is that our pronunciation dictionary does not currently contain these nonsense words. So if we open up, close off some of these finder windows, if we go to example for English, um, I have included a new lexicon for us. Um, but let's just take a look at one of these wave files. This is just me producing things. Um, and I sort of like determined whether I tried to like produce schwa in some and I tried not to produce schwa in others. So there were words like kpabi or ktara, which in English, those are illegal consonant clusters. So we don't have words beginning with KP or KT. And frequently, so there's a paper from my advisor and Lisa Davids with Colin Wilson, and then also Lisa Davidson, uh, looking at some of these productions, I've sort of replicated part of their study here. Kapavi. Okay. Katada. And in some of these, they are schwa full, they have a schwa in them. And some of them actually, I was able to transition from uh, the stop consonant to the next stop consonant without a schwa. Okay, so here's one. Tage. Okay, so we can see the stop burst, no schwa, next stop burst. Okay. Tage. And. Tpabe. Mm, hopefully, that might just be aspiration. Badafa. Okay, but that one, that's a bit schwaful. Badafa. So we could as phoneticians or speech scientists go through and label these as schwaful or not schwaful or like missing the schwa. Um, or we could try and have the aligner do it for us. Um, so to do this, we're going to take advantage of the pronunciation dictionary. And because these are all nonsense words, none of them are actually specified in the American English uh, pronunciation dictionary that we downloaded. So I created a new dictionary here in CC list that lists all of the words, nonsense words that I've said, um, but I now have two uh, pronounce, possible pronunciations. One that is missing the schwa and another that has the schwa in it, okay? And what the aligner is now going to do is it will, in the uh, text grids, I've specified, okay, this is the, the target word is kapabi. Um, and now the aligner is going to put equal probability over both of these pronunciations and try to determine based on the acoustics, which is the more likely pronunciation, okay? Um, you can technically, these days you can specify whether you think one should, you can sort of bias it towards one pronunciation over the other with pronunciation probabilities. But if you don't, we're not going to get into that um, in this tutorial, but you can just, if you don't specify pronunciation probabilities, it just puts equal probability over all the entries for a given word. So if you had three entries, it would do a third, 0.33. Um, if you had four, four possible pronunciations for a word, it would put a probability of 0.25 on and so forth, okay? So here we just have two possible pronunciations. So um, let's, I'm actually going to try, let's try moving CC list into, the pre-trained uh, pre -trained models dictionary. Okay, so if you navigate on the GUI to pre-trained models dictionary, I'm going to copy CC list and just paste it into the dictionary. We'll see if this works. I'm hoping because of what we found out with Keith that we won't have to write out the whole path if we put it in this folder. Okay, and the other part of the setup we have to do is, um, wipe out the input output folders and redo it. Yes, this is exactly how, so Christina's asking, is this how you would encode sociolinguistic variability? Are there word lists that exist for major English varieties or at least common sociolinguistic variables? Um, so to answer the first question, yes, this is exactly how um, some of those papers who that are automatically detecting G dropping or TH fronting and all of those, this is, I, I, my understanding is, is this is how they are doing it. And so George Bailey has a nice paper on this, 2016. Ewan and Lieberman, actually the original Pen Force Aligner paper, I believe was doing this. Um, so the one that you would cite for the original Pen Force Aligner, I think had this modification of the lexicon, I think to look at L, L variation. And then Ewan and Lieberman, 2011 also has it. 
Um, so yeah, they they were ahead of the game. Um, so okay, what else? Um, I don't know for the second question. I don't know um, if there exist uh, dictionaries with this already. Um, thank you. Uh, so what I would recommend, what I, what I've done in the past to sort of insert this. Uh, I, I kind of insert it automatically with like a Python script that does some regex matching uh, that then generates two forms for each pronunciation. So yeah, there is some scripting you could do to automate the like addition. So like for every word that ends in ing, find those words and then automatically uh, create another possible entry in the dictionary that's either ing or in. Yeah, Jen. Hi, thank you so much for this. This has been an amazing session. Um, since we've kind of entered into this realm of non-words and sociolinguistic variability, um, uh -huh. I just had a question about um, your advice about transcription conventions, which is kind of a big question. So don't, yeah. <laughs> it's possible yeah. to answer. So right, like Fave had these, this very extensive set of conventions for representing disfluencies and false starts and, uh, incomprehensible things that you have a guess at and all this. And my sense in kind of running fave style Elan transcriptions turn into text grids through MFA is that the MFA just kind of like ignores it all. But do you have a sense of how much it is worth representing disfluencies, false starts? Um, like what has been your experience with dealing with uh, spontaneous speech? That's actually a good question. Um, so I, it looks like my guests from the listed phones is so usually how, how some aligners will model these disfluencies is they actually create a phone for them. Mm -hmm. So they'll have like a cough phone and like, a I don't know, extra noise phone. Um, I don't know. It's not listed in this phone set, whether there are different types of models for like coughs and ums and all of that. So I don't know how it would handle those. If you do have it transcribed in the transcript and it's not in the dictionary, um, actually we can check the dictionary. So this would be the, the other place that it would be stored is in the dictionary to see it does not, this dictionary does not have the set of coughs and like whatever. Um, some of them do, let me see actually if I go, to my old Montreal forest aligner. Did I have? No, it did not. Some of the CMU pronouncing dictionaries start with like bracketed words and those bracketed words then will be mapped to a certain phone. Um, and I don't think I have that version of the dictionary. So I suspect it just gets um, thrown out into an unknown, if it is in the transcript and it's not in the dictionary, then it, there's an unknown word model and it will try and just skip over that section until it can find, um, and it'll start looking for the next words acoustics. Um, but that can throw the aligner off because it has to do some guessing. Um, what, you, what, what you could do though is add it to the dictionary and yeah, I'd have to dig around a little bit more to see if there is a phone model for unk like unknown mm. or noises or coughs. I, um, yeah, with a lot of my research, I haven't had to deal with that as much yet. Um, I, yeah, I'm stuck in the red speech land, sadly. Um, but yes, for spontaneous speech, it can be more difficult to do the alignment as I'm sure you're aware. Also because speech is much more reduced, faster. And so also that 30 millisecond duration requirement can sometimes be very frustrating. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll have to look into that some more, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. I mean, I think my usual procedure is to say like, if there's something with linguistic content, like a false start where someone says half a word, it's probably mm -hmm. a good idea to transcribe the half a word with a dash and then add that later to the dictionary. But if it's yeah. like a cough or yeah. somebody like laughing, just try to like keep it out of your annotations and just <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, if I actually, if I go back to where was my, my old Montreal forced aligner, the old dictionary I was using, 
I think I do have, I did like vocay, mm, yeah, UPS. I, I did, so this is something that you can do with the dictionary is you can just take what I was doing is I just took the old dictionary, English dictionary, and I've just added a ton of words myself using the same transcription system. So, and because these weren't in the uh, original dictionary, so things like um, and I just gave them a phonetic pronunciation. So you can absolutely do this yourself just make sure it's just like writing an ipa you're just writing an arc of it mm -hmm. okay okay thank you yeah yeah thank you great question um okay so back to our nonsense words uh and modifying the lexicon so i could technically just add these words to our english dictionary but i can also just keep it separate doesn't matter as long as i call the right dictionary um so where did we leave off we had put these in our pre-trained models documents, MFA, pre-trained models, dictionary folder. So now that diction, that new dictionary is present. And we just need to create our input and output folders on the desktop. Uh, did I already do that? No, these are the old ones. Again, I'm just going to delete them because this is not, they're just toy examples. And recreate them. Input, output. up a little bit. Okay, and I think and we're still going to use the English model. So we have wave files. Oh, I have to put the we have to put the wave files and text grids in the input folder. Super important stuff. Um, so if we go to the Montreal Force Aligner tutorial folder, example four, copy just the text grids and the wave files. There are other files that I've included in there including that Wilson Davidson and Sean Martin study. I'm going to command C or you can right click copy and I'm just going to paste those into the desktop input folder. Okay. And once we have that done, then I think we should be ready to go. Okay, so again, we need our we need to prep the text grids we need to prep the wave file well, sort of prep the wave files we need to put those in the input folder we need to have an output folder and we just need to make sure our dictionary is appropriate and our acoustic models are appropriate okay so this is always the checklist you should be going through when you run the aligner okay so we are once again going to align the um data but now we're going to let the aligner will sort of choose a pronunciation for us based hopefully by using the acoustic information okay so we're going to do the same align command mfa space align space again input output folders at the edges of the arguments but don't forget the clean flag dash dash clean we are reusing the folder name so clean it out and it's going to be input it doesn't matter whether you, you include that slash or not, space. English, that's our dictionary. Oh no, it's not, our dictionary name has changed. It is now called capital C, capital C underscore list. Is that correct? Yes. Hopefully this works. And I think we just leave off the dot text and we're gonna see if this works. I haven't actually tried this yet. Put a space after that. The acoustic model is English space and our output folder is already on the desktop and it's called output and i'm gonna hit enter and we will see okay it seems to have found the dictionary so that's great this is so useful is that running for people Okay, a fast alignment for me. Uh, chat. Yes, it's running. Awesome. Okay, I'm just going to open up that output. Okay, and so hopefully your output looks exactly like my output um there shouldn't be any variation uh so here we can see this is the first utterance Kapavi. 
And um, it said, yeah, there's a schwa. And I would agree with that. There's definitely a little schwa there. Oh, it can't find the dictionary. So the dictionary needs to be in documents, MFA, pre-trained models dictionary. And it's there. And is it called capital C? Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> typo or something. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, yeah, so for the first utterance, it said, yes, there's a schwa. Second one, it said, no, there's not a schwa. Tada. And I would agree with that as a phonetician. So this is the K and here's the T, all right. Tada. And for the third one, oh, I don't know if I would agree with that one. Um, that looks like just a bit of aspiration, but it said, oh, that aspiration is sufficiently schwa-like that it went with the schwa. So maybe a little bit of variation in terms of how the phoneticians and the aligner does it. This one I would agree with. No schwa, I don't see any voice bar or anything. And this one, it says, yes, there's a schwa. Badafa. The what I said. I don't know if I'd agree with the alignment. Maybe. Okay. Um, so so this is fun. It's you can play around with it. Of course, like there's been there have been some really interesting papers that use this to automatically classify things. Um, what is nice about it is oh, okay. Uh oh yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. Um, what is nice about it is it is um more hands-off like it's not human judgment it is just a machine producing this so anyone else could run this and get the exact same decisions okay so so that's kind of nice that it's fully replicable any questions actually i feel like um given the time uh unfortunately thank you so much for all who've come um so we'll leave this time for questions um unfortunately we didn't make it to the training example but what I will say with training is it's almost identical to alignment. You put all of, um, you will still have to specify that dash dash clean. Um, and it takes instead of, let's see, MFA train has one, two, three arguments instead of four. So in some ways it's actually simpler than the align model. So it would just be MFA space train. And we can um, see the arguments there. So it's just the corpus directory. That's our input directory. You would provide the exact same types of wave files and text grids with utterances in them. Um, so it's no different from alignment. Then you specify the dictionary path. You still need that pronunciation dictionary. And then you just specify the output path. Um, and it will just, it will uh, train an acoustic model for you. Um, and it, automatically does the alignment at the same time. So it will still send the aligned text grids to that output folder, but then in your documents folder, there will also be a model over here and you could technically save the output of that model, okay? So if you wanna save the model, there's um, this MFA model save, it's the acoustic model, and you have to look around, the, it generates several, there are several alignment, training and alignment passes this SA22 ally one, I believe is the last one that it does, but in every single one of these alignment folders, so ally is alignment, there's an, something called acoustic underscore model dot zip. You can just save that. Um, so I did this for Guara, uh, Guarani, um, and then you can reuse that model just like you would use the English model. Okay, so the, this is really cool. Um, yeah, so Christina. Um, I'm just wondering about the training. So the example, what you're talking about is you have to give like a long stretch of speech to, to and, a, and a dictionary to do this training. Is yeah. there a way? Um, suppose you, still, you, you still want short utterance. Oh, sorry, sorry, yeah. short, short utterances. You do need, you technically, you should have a, ton, a lot of speech. To sorry, so a lot of speech and shorter. So what I'm wondering is, um, is there a way to manually speak specify where you want about like a boundary to go like could you segment some portion of speech because you're a very particular like I want it aligned here <laughs> and could you give it something like is there does that exist um so I think the closest thing would just be when you create the input files making sure that your utterance boundaries are really precise 
Is that what you're referring to? No, I'm wondering if like, uh, I'm trying to think, like suppose, you know, you could imagine somebody like the closure, for example, or the the, the, the burst oh. of a stop, right? Like, you, you yeah. know, maybe you want to put it with your closure. Maybe you want to put it as its own thing. Maybe you want to put it as part of the vowel. You could make different decisions depending on what you're analyzing. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a way to force it to make one decision over another? Not easily. Okay. Uh, it would involve, I think, uh, yeah, so this is where um, additional uh, toolkits like auto VOT uh, okay. sort of have their niche, which is like taking the general generic aligner output and then refining it um, to do things like, I don't care about the closure, give me the stop release. Okay. Um, so not that I know of. Okay. You, yeah, you would need to like almost train a different model to learn that. Okay. Yeah, yeah and I, I guess I was wondering, um, like that was, an, that's, you know, one place I could see it being useful. I guess I was wondering, what if you didn't have like a long stretch of speech of a language? Could you in some sense, but you had, let's say a lot of speakers for a few, like for just a few words or something, you know, mm -hmm. like a, a, a word list or whatever, could yeah. you like segment, you know, a portion of it um, as the, as training essentially, um, like it's, if there uh, was a dictionary yeah. already existing for. So, um, yeah, so the training will work on any corpus size, um, okay. like it's just applying math. It doesn't really care. Um, okay. it's just not going to necessarily be as reliable if it's only like, you know, one speaker per utterance, maybe don't apply speaker adaptation. If that's, there might be a way to specify this. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, the like the Spanish example here, actually, if you look at that um, folder on the desktop, it actually only has two WAV files in it. Okay. And actually, it wasn't even ten minutes. It might even be like it's really short. Um, so it's like it's a very short amount of speech. And so I tried. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so I tried aligning this and, you know, we could also try aligning it, but the output was like really not good, okay. but it's only, but it's only two wave files. And these are really short stretches of speech. As soon as like, when I went to the Guarani, uh, Guarani example, um, it had 50 minutes of speech from 32 speakers, which actually isn't even all that much either, uh, when it comes to training these corpora. But as soon as I went up to 50 minutes, it was like, oh, this is much, this output looks reasonable. Whereas okay. like the Spanish one with those like five, five to 10 minutes of speech, it was like, okay. At least the boundaries are in place, but this right. requires a full manual cleanup. So I would give that Spanish one a try. The other yeah. issue that I want to point out in the Spanish example, in case you do do this at home, is that this Spanish uh, dictionary provided on the MFA website is uh from spain so it is not the same phonetic pronunciations as many most spanish varieties right um so there are so many issues uh with this um with this alignment process but it was just sort of highlights what can go wrong with training and aligning that like you need to be aware of the assumptions you're making and what data you are feeding the system thank, thank you. you so much oh i'm thank so glad you. yeah the <laughs> Yeah. The, um, yeah, teaching new students, there will always be errors and yeah, they are fun to deal with, but we all encounter them. <laughs> okay, so how much precise, how precisely would one we need to annotate the data? I see the Guarani data is annotated only at the utterance level. Um, it doesn't make sense to use such data to align at the word syllable phoneme boundary lab label. Um, so I, I I might follow up with you on this question just to see if I understood correctly, but as a first attempt answer, um, typically you do want to provide it uh, like utterances under 30 seconds. Um, and that's how you should chop up the signal. Uh, the Guarani example is from the common voice corpus from Mozilla, and uh, they have already, they've not only chopped up the uh, like the transcript, but they give you short individual sound files. So each utterance is in its own wave file. Um, and so the transcript is just in that wave file. So that's the other way to do it. Um, so maybe 
did I answer your question? Maybe I should just speak up. Uh, yeah, uh, my question is, uh, when you want to train a model mm -hmm. uh, and you want to use that model to get alignment at the, let's say, word level, yeah. doesn't it matter if you use uh, more, you know, I mean, the, the, the aligner, doesn't the aligner need to be trained, you know, more precisely in order to give you a more precise output, so to say? Um, so, like, are you, is the question like, is this, is this too broad or is this too narrow? What we're getting Yeah, at? it's, it's too broad, but you want, at the end, you need more, you know, narrower. So actually, this is what the aligner is like, trained to do so if you remember were you here at the beginning of the mm -hmm. workshop with the overview so um what the aligner is going to do is break these words up into sequences of phones and it um and so it sends this through the lexicon and it gets a sequence of phones and then by going through multiple passes through lots of data it starts to figure out it starts to maximize the transition probability like uh it, it starts to really learn good acoustics for each of the phones. And this is just lots of math thrown at the problem and it happens to work really well. Um, so actually something like this does produce reasonably good results uh, as long as you have enough data. And this is where like, if you don't have a lot of data, it doesn't have a lot of opportunity to learn what the acoustics of each phone is. Okay, are. yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, but this actually, when I did run this, uh, so this, when I ran the full aligner, which was um, a lot more files than this, it uh, it took about an hour to a lot to train. Um, but it actually, I think it did a pretty good job. But it's going through all of this data, and it has the sequence of phones, and it it actually does a decent job, even though it looks like like how is it doing that um again because the problem is so constrained we're saying here is the sequence of acoustic frames and here is the sequence of phonemes you you can only move so much in one direction or the other you can't uh swap phonemes around they always have to be in the same order and that really constrains the problem so that it can like figure out oh this actually if i if i go to the next state it, it's basically it generates multiple, several paths through the data. Like, do I stay in the same state? So if I go back to this. So when it's trying to figure out, like what are the acoustics of the M model? Um, it's actually generating multiple possibilities. And then it chooses the maximum like likelihood probability. I think it's some, I think it's the maximum likelihood one. There's the Viterbi algorithm is what it's called that chooses the highest probability path through all of the possible transitions. So it basically creates this whole matrix of like possible transitions and it figures out the best path through all the possibilities of do I stay in the state or do I move on to the next? And through that like maximum likelihood, I think, I think it's, yeah. Uh, through that, it's going, it's figuring out the acoustics of the phonemes. No, th thanks. Thanks for the yeah. explanation. Hopefully that helps. Um, but yeah, believe it or not, actually, you know, giving it these coarse things ends up okay as long as you have data, which is, yeah, what all the engineers now are hungry for. Everyone's data hungry. Any other questions? So yeah, I do highly recommend the training and acoustic model feature is brilliant um, because as you can probably see, there are only so many pre-trained acoustic models available, but if you can um, get a good number of wave files and text grids and you have a decent pronunciation lexicon or you can generate one, uh, then you can train up your own acoustic models and then save that output and reuse them on new data. So at least like in the UK, it's always been shocking that there's been no British English acoustic model that's readily available. But um, 
now you can create your own basically. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, I guess at this point, um, I'll stick around for a bit if there are any lingering questions, but thank you so much for your time and for sticking through this. Um, I hope it was useful in some respect. Um, and thank you again for having me. So thank you, Juan, for hosting this and to Rutgers for funding. And yes, I'll, I'll let Juan answer that question. Um, yes, um, I will. Um, if you completed uh, the sign in sheet, I have your email and then I'm going to send an email to to everyone who completed the, the, the sign in form um, to with instructions on how to access the recording. Awesome. Yes, and thank you, Eleanor. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording now.